Welcome to this very special episode of Tim Talk, the podcast about the DC anime universe co-created by Bruce Tim. I'm Chris Lord. I'm Cameron Dexter. And uh, today we are not talking about the DC anime universe. We're not even talking about the DC extended universe or even the Marvel cinematic universe. We're talking the Spielberg cinematic universe. Spiel- yeah, I, I can't shorten that. The SCU. Anyway. Yeah, there we go. The SCU. Sure. Because his latest film, Ready Player One, landed this week, and we were so damn excited about it. it had so much to say that we did a whole episode about it. We, we were we were very excited. We were very excited about it, but we couldn't some just of talk. Us not as excited as we walked out. <laughs> but we needed some help to talk about this, we and did. so we brought on our our good friend and the third member of the Burger Fan Club triumvirate, Shane Tully. Oh, hello. Hello, welcome. Thanks for having me. Is this your first podcast? Uh, no. I've, you uh, fucking asshole. I'm so sorry. <laughs> God, I wanted that cherry so bad. <laughs> I know. <laughs> You'll never get that. Uh, no, I, got, like, I would say like f- seven or eight years ago, a friend of mine, he's a, he's actually a sportscaster in Boston. Okay. Shout out DJ Bean. Uh, him and I recorded a couple test pods in case we wanted to ever do something. And okay. We, it was, uh, the theme was the last pod you'll ever do. <laughs> Okay. And every episode was a different last pod of an episode of a series that never existed. And uh it was it was pretty cool. Wait, have you told us about this before? I this sounds like I've, I've this sounds this familiar. Before. I mean, I only have like four jokes. Get ready, <laughs> podcast universe. And so I probably did at some point tell you that. Okay, because I'm like, this sounds like a great idea as you're describing. I'm like, wait a minute, we may have had this conversation once before. Here's the problem though. When you actually go and try and execute this thing where you have all these recurring jokes that you've never done before. They don't hit as well as you think they would. <laughs> no. What? Yeah. That's also, why like, I never really got out of that test song, the well, test phase. Also, think about it. Like, what podcast do you know have a finale? Like, they all go on forever. Yeah. Seinfeld. That's not a podcast. It's in fact a television program. <laughs> I only listen to the audio. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. All right. So you, you don't even know then the Kramer entrance. What are you talking about? Oh god. I thought man. it was just, just a door just... a door opening. <laughs> oh, great fully work though on those yeah. doors. Oh man. So... We got a lot of fully work talk today. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so we we have all okay. I so said we have all read. Uh, Shane, you and I have both read Ready Player One. Cameron, you, you you listened to it. <laughs> oh, you're a big Seinfeld guy. I'm a big Seinfeld fan. <laughs> You've listened to it on a number. I of usually times. have Seinfeld on with no audio, and I'm watching that and listening to Ready Player One at the same time. Oh, see, then you're not getting the whole Seinfeld audiobook experience. How how I'm well not. those two sync up? Actually, oh, pretty great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like Wizard of Oz and Pink Floyd. Yeah, I mean, I've always thought that. <laughs> what? <laughs> No, if you listen to Pink Floyd backwards, it like matches up to the. Was it, is it backwards or no, forwards? No, if you just put Dark Side of the Moon on at the same time as you start the movie Wizard of Oz, uh, they actually like sync up through the first like hour. That's cool. Yeah, you've never heard that. No, you live on the internet. I I do, but I'm also <laughs> 24 years old. Oh, oh shit, he's a real person. <laughs> I thought he was just an idea. <laughs> you're just. We're, I'm not we're just here. It's just stereotypes just and tropes. Chris and I and a concept. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> It's a walking uh, John Hughes character. <laughs> I mean, so we were all pretty excited for this movie because we all enjoyed the book. Yeah, right? definitely. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one massive nostalgia fest. Um, but who are we to judge? We do a podcast about twenty-year-old cartoons. So, in did you guys find? Oh, by the way, for those listening, obviously we're going to do all kinds of spoilers. Yeah. Like we're, we're here for the full-on discussion, every aspect possible. <laughs> I prefer to only talk about reviews that are spoiler-free. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> We'll just kick it out then, and we'll finish it off after 20 minutes. Thanks for having me, guys. It's been real, real. Um, Did you guys, uh, I guess, what did you think? Just right off on the top, did you enjoy it? Cameron, you've seen it a few times. (laughs) I've seen it twice. Okay. Uh, That's that's less than I thought. Almost almost a third time. (laughs) I think that's only a couple. Yeah. Yeah. If if I wasn't dying on my couch yesterday, I would have seen it a third time. Why were you dying on your couch yesterday? I was sick yesterday. You were sick yesterday? I was. What? Yeah. It happens rarely. Oh, wow. Um, Look at this legend coming out to podcast, even with a cold. Yeah. I know. I mean, yeah. You made Nothing it You me. made it through Friday, like a late night showing you the movie, and you're here early on a Sunday morning. Yeah. Yeah. I'm impressed, man. It's dedication. Always. To a movie that you found okay. That I found okay. <laughs> well, I, spoilers. Jeez. <laughs> well, I, I realized on my second viewing what put such a bad taste in my mouth. And I think we can all agree it's it's the last three minutes of the movie. Uh, yeah. Are mm. so horribly, st- like, not even stereotypical, just, like, the worst of movie tropes. I, I would say it's very tone deaf, given everything that's going on in the world in general. Yes. Mm-hmm. It feels like something that was in, like, a movie from 2004. Yeah. Not 2018. Where mm-hmm. I was like, ah, it all works out if you're the main character. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, so I'm trying to remember, how did the book end? I have a vague recollection, but I know it's a little bit different. 
Cameron, our, our dedicated expert here. How many times have you listened I've to listened the audio? To it four times. I just started it again. Wow. What? It's dedication right there. Yeah. You really well, I have to make it through all of Seinfeld while only listening to this book. <laughs> it's nine so, seasons. Yeah. I know. It's a lot to get through. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nine seasons in a movie. And you've always the thought, movie. while watching Seinfeld, no, it would make this better. Will Wheaton narration. Exactly. So. Apparently, there's a poster of Will Wheaton in the movie. Because oh, what? He, yeah, because he still is president in that world. Oh, fuck. We, I forgot that that was a thing in the book world. Mm-hmm. Oh, we right. We just never touched on it in the movie. Right. That seems like a shame. We should have had a moment about that. Yeah, it feels like they should have extended the movie by about 50 minutes and added a whole political piece. There should, oh, absolutely. should have been. Yeah. You know what that movie really needed? <laughs> Donald Trump. More time. More screen time. More running time. Yes. It did need a lot more running time. Um, Wait, so how... Uh, remind me, though. I, I don't remember. I remember... I'll uh, I'll chime in a little bit. Okay, yeah, yeah. They're at uh they're at Ogden Morrow's place, mm-hmm. and then they all had they all come out, and so he's like kind of reconciling with uh, what is it, Show and H and mm-hmm. Ogden, and he hasn't met Artemis yet in real life. Oh, that's oh, right, I forgot that's about right. that. And yeah. so then she comes out and she reveals that uh, even though she's beautiful in the game, she has a birthmark in real life, so that means she's flawed. Yep. Uh, and he's like, I'll forgive you because. I look past this one single small piece of your 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 like your, uh, your face, and I truly love you. And then the last page is he, she's like, well, I guess I could love you too. And he's like, also, I'm rich. And then they both jump in the air, and there's a montage. Yeah. That sounds, Woo! Yeah. That's not like a movie ending that I would like better. <laughs> well, it, from what I also seem to recall about the end of the book, though, is that it we don't know if he's going to keep the oasis running or shut it off mm-hmm. right yeah. it's like he's given the choice and he decides to step out of the oasis to go meet artemis right yeah the last IRL. The, the last line is like he has no like for the first time in his life he had no desire to go back yeah so it's kind of indicating that he's finally succeeded in some way in his life and understood the importance yeah. i feel like maybe that's part of the reason the ending here didn't land for me as much is that it, it didn't have that ambiguity it didn't let you decide what should happen next it was very clear like oh yeah like we kept the oasis going but don't worry we close it on tuesdays and thursdays so i can sit in a big comfy chair move, with my hot to girlfriend be honest. like as someone who's gone through massive video game addiction closing it for two days Especially when the whole world operates on that. I mean, it's basically like shutting down the world economy for for two, two days, days a week. Every week. My thing is, why did they close it on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and not like Saturday and Saturday Sunday? and Sunday? Like make yeah. a weekend yeah, out like, of it, sort of thing. <laughs> he's like, I'm the creator, and I created a new weekend, but they don't match. Yeah, that's true. Actually, why would you want two back to back days of like going off and doing your thing, make a little trip somewhere? <laughs> Dude, you know, people must be fiending for internet on Wednesdays, though. Oh yeah, oh, that's yeah. True. yeah, they're getting everything they can in there. Yeah. Oh, so much porn. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't like that they were like, they, it was kind of a half-assed solution. Like, oh yeah, like we kind of kept it open, but we like, you know, can't yeah. shut it down. It almost, like you said, it feels like they should have stopped the movie 30 seconds before, or just not had that last scene. Yeah. Because, yeah. like you said, the ambiguity, it's like, why is Inception fun at the end? Because you don't know if it's real or not. Yeah. And it's like, if at the end there was like... The die falls and it's it, it, it's real. Like, yeah, it's real. Well, well that's oh, way cool. less interesting. All right, okay. Well, I guess we have nothing to talk about. Cool, yeah. that's fantastic. The, the shot before that's also beautiful, where it's the overhead panning shot and you see the whole crew, where it's like you see Wade and Ogden walking away, and then you see uh, the rest of the high five behind them. You see H interviewing, or not interviewing, talking to the police about the accusations. Then it ends with the two of them getting arrested, mm-hmm. and like that's a it just like continue flying back. And I get flies over, um, what GGS? Not not what is it? The stacks? Uh, no, the the Columbus, Ohio. Yes. Uh, what's the the IOI? Com- no, the other company. Oh, gregarious games. Gregarious. That's, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like how you were you're like GGS, and we're like, what? Uh, well, that's what they, that's, <laughs> that's what they say in the first chapter. Cause that's as far as I made it yesterday. Is this fifth fifth listening? Yeah. Um. Um. But yeah, if they just like showed the because you don't see that the whole time, and it would be nice to see like, like the highlight of Columbus because they did say like that's the fastest growing city because of this company. It would have been nice to see like the Holy Land before it ended. <laughs> Columbus. I think Columbus, you know, Ohio. No, I Is think this you actually have Prince of Egypt on the mind. Here. I do have Prince of Egypt on the mind. <laughs> Is this a tourism video for Columbus, Ohio? Yes. But it's like hey, Columbus. It's gonna survive the apocalypse. <laughs> yeah. Did you see the tourism video for Oregon? No, no, I, I that, put it in the plugs a couple weeks ago, you, but I haven't actually watched oh it. Oh my god, it's it's like very it's very based in Miyazaki artwork and art style, and it's gorgeous. <laughs> Wait a second, it's basically just Miyazaki's like, not from Oregon. 
It's like, what? <laughs> the, the jewel of Portland. <laughs> Come to Portland. We have craft beer and hipsters. <laughs> and Hayao Miyazaki. Yeah. Do you like anime? You can get that anywhere. But we paid for it. <laughs> um, no, the, the idea of the commercial is it's slightly over-exaggerated. Um, yeah, I think that's actually so the, the, name of the, the video. flannel patterns on everyone's <laughs> shirts are just a little bit outside the scope of reality. Mm-hmm. This Pantone is wild. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. I, I, I highly recommend you watch it. All right, sounds good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ready Player Two is actually just a, a tourism video for Oregon. Yeah, sick. Yeah. Um, God, do you think they're gonna do a Ready Player Two? No. Yes. You think so? I think they will. Well, I know they're doing a book. Are they? Ernest Klein's working on a sequel, right? Oh, thank God. I've been waiting it's, it's for... It's been, like... He's been talking about that for a while, though. Oh, but I thought it was, like, officially announced sometime this last year. Oh, I'll, I'll listen to it. You're our expert on this. Yeah, Shouldn't man. you know these things? I should. <laughs> all God you, damn it. All you Thrones heads, we're finally getting pages from the real God, <laughs> Ernest Klein. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I'm I'm very curious to see if we'll actually get a sequel or not. I think it's looking at, like, a 53 million opening weekend, which is not great, considering the budget was... What probably close two hundred? I was say it's got to be like two hundred, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. I mean, worldwide, I think this one's going to do amazing, though. I think it will. I think it's going to do much better probably overseas than it is going to do here. I'm like, I don't know though, because it's so grounded in American pop culture and like American pop culture from a from decades that didn't necessarily translate out to the rest of the world. I think mm-hmm. though, like that nostalgia is just so sellable in 2018. <laughs> yeah, it's probably like you know pervaded other cultures. It's just al- almost like you think. If those other cultures are, say, five years, ten years behind on American pop culture just because that's the trickle effect, yeah, they're probably going to be like, oh, these things are somewhat more relevant to us because you know we're, what? we're getting them. You're right. I think Chinese audience are going to go, oh, my God, there's a Jack Slater reference in here. I've been dying for that. <laughs> Is that Last Action Hero? What? <laughs> it's my favorite movie. It's the best Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. They ju- the, um, most other international cultures have just seen Bill Murray in Stripes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, oh, but they're getting Scrooge this Christmas. They're very excited about it. Oh, man. I'm Are jealous. they? Because we got to make this a Scrooge podcast because it's got a lot of stuff to say about that movie. I've actually never seen Scrooge. Really? Don't. Oh, okay. I'll pass on it then. Yeah. It's like a surrealist Bill Murray movie, but that's neither here nor there. Right. Um, yeah, there were. I, I'd also be very interested in seeing how the international audience. Yeah, looks at this movie. I, I just took a quick gander at like the box office results on my way in because mm-hmm. it's early. And I didn't put a lot of effort into this. You should pay attention when you drive. <laughs> no, no, it's L.A. That's yeah. the whole point. You don't pay attention when you drive. Right. You have to go with the natural chaos that flow around you. If you're the one person trying to drive like a human, you're doomed. That's a very mm-hmm. good point. Yeah, you can't resist entropy. No. Um, but I mean, we have seen a big trend over the past couple of years of trying to play towards the Chinese market just because they do accept more movies now. And I feel like this movie didn't play into it as much as others, especially with how little, even though Daito and Sho are Japanese, <laughs> uh, how little kind of screen time they got and how they were pure stereotypes. You had a samurai uh, and a ninja, yeah. and he controlled a Voltron, not a Voltron, a, a Gundam. yeah. What do you think the things that uh, sell to a Chinese market? Like, I honestly don't know. Is it like having Chinese actors? Oh, or... yeah. That is a big part of it, actually. Yeah. So a great example is... Um, triple X. Tri- I was triple, about triple to X. say Triple X. Yeah, triple X is. 3. Return of Xander Cage. Um, yeah. I was also going to say Iron Man 3. Um, the, the, so there's a... Because when he gets the, the shrapnel taken out of his heart at the end, there's mm-hmm. a Chinese surgeon that does that, and he goes to China to have it done. And that actor is, if I recall, like, pretty well known out in China. And oh, so cool. the Chinese release that movie has a whole scene where like someone shows up to this doctor's office like, Doctor, whatever your fucking name is, Tony Stark needs your help. It's like, all right. I'm on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's like a really interesting way to take like a somewhat of a throwaway scene. Obviously, it has plot value and everything. Yeah. But to then really make it like a sellable piece if you're, you know, capitalism, la, la, la. Mm-hmm. But like to take something and then just put that twist on it and yeah. suddenly people can attach to that. Yeah. And there's also, there's a couple movies, I can't remember them off the top of my head, but there's a couple movies that will actually add a scene or two just to cater to a Chinese market. Oh, wow. Yeah. And like, what will that, that scene will just involve Chinese actors or be shot in China? Or yeah. It'll, 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 yeah. I wasn't sure if there's like a type of scene that they, that the Chinese market likes to see or anything. Uh, I think they just like to see their own actors. I oh. think that the biggest example that I can think of is the Red Dawn remake with, um, mm, sorry, I missed that one. <laughs> how dare you? You missed Josh Peck and Liam Hemsworth. 
Dude, Josh Peck is no Patrick Swayze. Oh, wait, that's wait, all I'm going to say. Was it Liam? I thought that was... Oh, was it? I think it's Chris. Is I think it, it was Chris? made so long ago that it's actually Chris Hemsworth. Oh, I guess it is. Yeah, because they made it... I think this is part of the story you're going to tell. I'm going to take it away from you. Uh, it was fine. made such a long time ago that originally it was China that invaded, and then they went in and in post-production changed it to North Korea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. You know, because those cultures are just completely swappable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no problem. Just just change the color of the flags. Don't bother changing the language at all. You'll be good. No wow. one will notice. Did it actually work? No, I don't think anyone actually saw the Red Dawn remake. I did. <laughs> Cameron, you see everything, though. Only the bad stuff. I, I am so yeah. impressed that you are able, you are so much busier than Chris and I combined, <laughs> and yet you still are able to consume so much more culture. Well, this was back in end of high school, early college, when all I Right, that was like three was months watch. ago for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, dorm life is great. Dude, I'm so jealous, but I mean, I have a roommate, too, so I get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of a drag but you get used to it <laughs> nah she's cool we picked it ourselves instead of having to just get randomly assigned oh yeah no oh, that uh, worked out great for you then. yeah i got lucky yeah <laughs> i had a ton of credits going into my senior year there you go um but yeah so they're, they're, they do kind of and yeah with the triple x you did see like they had a huge korean pop star as one of the characters mm-hmm. uh, uh superpower djing yeah yeah oh, yeah <laughs> sorry who uh, one of the characters what? in Triple X, they're like, they have that moment at the start where you know they identify in like the first act where they identify all these characters by sure. like, explaining their their previous exploits. Mm-hmm. And so, like the Hound from Game of Thrones, his thing is he used to be a stunt man, and so he's like willing to do like dangerous things and he can withstand like the like the concussions. Yeah, he, he's and the driver. He'll do yeah. anything for money. Yeah. He, he's already got CTE, so he doesn't really care about getting more concussions. <laughs> and. Then they show, like, the other characters, and each one of them has a power. Like, one of them's a really good shooter. One of them's, like, a thief. And the Korean pop star's strength is he's a very good DJ. Yeah. So what does he contribute to the mission of Triple X3? They go to, like, a spring break island. (laughs) And he starts DJing to distract everyone. And they're like, (laughs) these beats are so fire that everyone gets distracted. I mean, that is a vital skill set. It is. Yeah. (laughs) You know... It felt like in like the eighties James Bond where they're like, here is the where Q is like, oh, 007, here's this thing that you could only use in one specific situation, and then it comes up. Oh yeah, who would have thought? Oh, the nineties was the most egregious for that though. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, the most like uh, reverse engineered gadget of all time in James Bond is the ski jacket that has the avalanche cocoon <laughs> that he just happens to need. Because he spontaneously decides to go and check the lines up in the snow. <laughs> hey, hey, you know, <sighs> maybe he was checking the lines because he knew he had an avalanche ski jacket. Yeah, he wouldn't That's have, true, he actually. He's like, so you know, I'm prepared that. for this. I'm going to head out there and go see this it's for like, myself. I really, yeah. I really just want Q to know that I used this stuff. Yeah, do you think he caused that avalanche? Do you think he, like, deliberately had the para- <laughs> paraglider crash into the snow just so he could use the gadget and come oh, back yeah. like, Q, this doesn't work as well as I wanted it to? I think if it, came, if it didn't work as well as he wanted to, he wouldn't be coming back. No. <laughs> I think that was Q's intention, actually. I'm so sick of this fucking asshole. It's time for you to die, 007. Oh, it's my turn now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just 90-year-old Desmond Well, and he's finally going to go out on his first field mission. Now, <laughs> I think I've earned this clout. Uh, so, ready player one. <laughs> oh, that thing. Right, that thing we're, we're here to talk about. Talking about. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. We're back. I mean, okay, so, I, I think I maybe enjoyed it the most, mm-hmm. which... I yeah, find I very agree. surprising. I I, do enjoy I it, hate everything. I did enjoy it a lot more on second viewing. Okay, it is like I said, it is just that last three minutes walking out of it the first time put such a bad taste in my mouth. I forgot every good thing that happened before it, and seeing it the second time kind of reminded me like, oh, I did like the race scene. That was pretty cool. The yeah, shining thing like, was awesome. Yeah, I think for me it was the same thing of like the the sticker shock of when it was not the same pacing, the same plot items mm-hmm. as the book. Which is fine because they did a really good job executing these replacement plot lines. Yeah, it just I kept on saying, "Wait a second, this isn't what happens." Right, but that doesn't mean I, that the book is right. I mean, Ernest Klein was on the screenplay, so it's not like he was yeah. like, "You're destroying my my perfection." And yeah. that book was not perfection by any means. Oh no, but it's just it's yes, a, it's it a, it's <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a damn good time. The book and I found the movie was the same for me. And I haven't I read it about a year ago. I think. Yeah. It's been a while, so I forgot. I vaguely recalled some of the general structure, but I forgot a lot of it, which helped. I think there for me, there was a couple things that I was really excited to see on screen. Okay. And so then when I didn't see them, I was a little disappointed there because I was like, oh, what does it look like to have a Dungeons & Dragons dungeon 
in this game? Like, okay. does it look 8-bit? Am I a normal person interacting in this 8-bit world? Mm -hmm. Or is everything fully fleshed out and realized? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, just, just those kind of pieces where I was like, oh, that would be cool. But then they gave me this amazing race scene that I was like, oh, this is awesome. This is really fun. They, I'm, I'm getting these little pop culture moments. Mm -hmm. It's totally worth it. But it wasn't something I had anticipated. So you I, were really excited to rewatch the entirety of Ferris Bueller's Day Off, yes. but without the charm of Matthew Broderick in the front of it. <laughs> yeah, instead with Ty of, Sheridan there. Uh, yeah. a, a digital <laughs> recreation of Ty Sheridan probably yeah. could do better than Matthew Broderick. Ty that's, Sheridan, that's aka Baby true. Miles Teller. Uh, someone, oh man, they said he was like a Nicholas Robinson from I Love Simon, but just like a bad version of him. Oh, but Nick Robinson is so good. Yeah, well, that's why Ty Sheridan's like the worst yeah. version of him. Wait, did you see Love Simon? No, not yet. Oh, you should watch oh, it. It's great. It's no. beautiful. I've already done a podcast on this. Just, <laughs> oh. It was not recorded, and it was with another friend. It was the last podcast of a film review series, and you ended on Love, Simon. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I okay, because I, I'd agree with that. I liked the new challenges. Okay, so I forgot the, so in the book, it was, what were the three? Because I forgot them. Uh, joust. Okay. The well, so in the book, uh, there were pretty much six challenges, because it was one for the key and one for the gate. Oh, so yeah. I forgot that entirely. And then there was the bonus one. Which was play the perfect game of Pac-Man. Oh, okay. So you had... Uh, I'm not sad that I missed the perfect game of Pac-Man. Yeah, how long, really, how long really would really that have taken to actually play a perfect... A perfect game of Pac-Man is about four hours, I want to say. Because uh, you have to get through level 256 without losing a life. Okay. Well, the original script apparently was going to be a mini-series, and the last four <laughs> episodes <laughs> was, was just a, someone playing a flawless game of Pac-Man. It was a $200 million Netflix original. Yeah. yeah. Cameron, we know you would watch it. Did you guys ever watch King of Kong? Yeah. Well, yeah. Can no. we just do a King of Kong's pod? Yeah. Did you also hear that he... Uh, yeah, he, his... yeah, he lost his records. And, mm -hmm. But then there's like these new guys that are just so much better at Donkey Kong than the rest of them. Yeah. Wait, are, okay, are you talking about the... Because I know of King Kong, but I haven't seen it. Is the It's about a guy, or is the director also the subject? Director, uh, no, the director did... Because he did something else recently. He did a bunch of stuff. Yeah, because I think he's doing narrative stuff now. No, he's uh, doing like fiction stuff, like big budget fiction stuff. Yeah, that's referred to as narrative. Is it really? In the biz. So... <laughs> Guys, just a little, <laughs> just a little heads up. I'm an accountant. <laughs> uh, um, That's fine. I'm barely an assistant. So what do I fuck do I know? Uh, I'm in the biz. That's true. He is actually in the biz. I don't think so. I'm on like the far edge of an advertising. Hey, hey, Fringe. Fringe is still in the biz, man. Yeah. He did Fringe. He did the Fox series Fringe. <laughs> um. Yeah, this is the real reveal of this episode, is that Cameron is, in fact, Joshua Jackson. What? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> hey, guys. I don't even know what this voice sounds like. No. <laughs> Seth Gordon. Your own voice? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, yeah, well, who's the director? Oh, oh, Seth, Seth Gordon. Oh, oh, he did Pixels. Good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, no, he's done... Glad to see he's really f really straight afar from video oh, 80, 80s video games. Oh, he did, oh, he did Baywatch? Mm -hmm. He's done episodes of The Goldbergs. Um, Sneaky Pete. Identity Thief. Horrible bosses or bosses was oh was breaking good. in. Oh. He did a couple of episodes. Do you guys know breaking in? No. Uh, it it was unfortunate that it came out at the exact same time as Breaking Bad. Oh, so it was constantly forgotten about. Uh, but it's about a bunch of um, it's a company that specializes in uh, cybersecurity oh. and and generic security. Mm -hmm. So it's a bunch of like thieves. It's almost like a tiny Ocean's Eleven oh. movie per episode. That's kind of cool. Yeah. So it's a bunch of uh, kind of specialty, like specialty thieves trying to hack these security systems so they can show that there's holes in their security systems. Oh. He headlined by Christian Slater yes. playing a character called Oz. Yep. It was so good, guys. Oh. <laughs> it was so yeah. good. Although, hang it was on. actually Christian Slater just was watching the yeah. show Oz yeah. the entire time. <laughs> Although it also did have Megan Mullally, who I love. Wait, was this a comedy? Yeah. And oh, Michael Rosenbaum. Oh, Michael Rosenbaum. Yeah, he who was, was the douchebag like, boyfriend. Wait, why was Christian Slater the main character if it was a comedy? No, he was, he was the boss. He wasn't doing the comedy heavy lifting, <laughs> my guess. <laughs> I don't know. It only lasted one season. Yeah. Might have been the reason. He was just yeah. there sounding real cool. <laughs> it, was, it, it was a very underrated show that I think deserved more than it got. Um, so, can we go, let's just unravel the thread. Uh, King of Kongs, Billy oh. Mitchell is the villain. There we go. He's a classic villain. Yes. He's amazing. You gotta, you honestly gotta see it. Going back, okay. <laughs> yeah. we're back to Ready Player One. Yeah, okay. What were we talking I don't about? Know. The, I don't know. <laughs> the, um, the King of Kong hole. Oh, we were talking about uh, the, the... Oh, the Pac-Man game. Yeah, Pac Oh, the flawless yeah, game of Pac-Man. Yeah, there was the, a, the, the six The six challenges. Books, yeah. yeah, so I definitely don't, like, I'm so glad they replaced the second <laughs> challenge, because the second challenge was, 
what uh, you have to like go around to a bunch of houses and collect items. And then recite the movie War Games, mm-hmm. oh. word for word. Word for word. Was yeah. there not? Oh, I guess it was War Games. Why did I think it was Ferris Bueller's Day Off? They word do do word. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. That's the it. gate. At one of them, I can't remember. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is War Games the third challenge? Uh, no. I think War Games is the key, and I don't think does he recite all of War Games, or does he just? He has to be the computer or something like that in War Games. Okay, because yeah. I don't. I do also remember him having to do something in Ferris Bueller. Yeah, I thought he had to recreate the entirety of Ferris Bueller's Day Off. All right. He had to like play it out. Bad radio. I'm researching it. Okay. Like, All right. Um, while, he, while while Shane does that, boom, 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 boom. Oh, I clicked on the wrong link. All right, that's fine. Uh, so Joust was the very first challenge. Okay. Against uh, the Dungeons and Dragons. Um, Skeleton oh, King. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. That did. That was pretty cool. Yeah, and that I was really excited to see that. Yeah. Just like. Uh, an avatar playing a skeleton king in a game of in an arcade cabinet. That would have been fun. Yeah. Yeah, ju- and also to have that moment where he's like about to confront him and then he creates instead an arcade cabinet. Yeah. And then I feel like that would have been, I thought that the way that they had like their meet cute for uh, Artemis and Parzival when they meet like in the middle of like a car accident, I was like, this is a little strange. Like, it feels like there, there was so much buildup that was required for her character. It's like, she's famous, and she's part of this, yeah. and she's part of all these things. And it was just kind of like throwaway lines. That mm-hmm. felt a little tough to then understand the the fact that her character was exceptionally important in this world. Yeah. And his character was nothing. That, so that world. was my, probably one of my biggest concerns with the movie is you didn't get to see how far behind Wade slash Parsifal was compared to everyone else. Like, H was like the number one uh, Gunter slash PvP player. Gunter? Yes. In uh, in the Oasis. Uh, Artemis was like this celebrity blogger. Yeah. Uh, I'm not gonna <laughs> not gonna join in on this Gunter bullshit. Um, she was this like, movie is gonna kill in the German market. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, no, it's crush. Yeah. Oh my god, it's just filled with Gunters. Oh, <laughs> um, Reviews are going to be terrible, but box office <laughs> yeah, turnout is going to be nuts. It's crazy. <laughs> it's a movie just about Gunters. Oh, my God. I'm a Gunter. Are you a Gunter? <laughs> <laughs> the movie, the, the actual, they, they changed the logline for Germany, and it's just, you are all Gunters. <laughs> Alles Gunter, yeah? <ja? laughs> I hate you guys. <laughs> uh, Please continue. So you, didn't, you didn't get to see, because like, yeah, H was... H was Super high up in the leaderboards yeah. and PvP stuff. Artemis was this like basically a, a celebrity in the world through her through her vlogs and, yeah. and stuff like that. And then like even Irock, who I also wanted him to have another motive besides being evil for the sake of evil. Wait, was Irock in the book? Yes. Okay, for some reason I thought that TJ uh, Miller said he? that the character yeah. was created. Well, he would know better than the rest of us having Yeah, I have no idea. I quote unquote yeah. read it <clears throat> four times. Fuck <laughs> you. <laughs> um yeah, so Irock was, um, he was also one of the highest ranked players. Uh, so if you remember, H had H's basement, which was like a private chat room. Oh, area. Right, right, yeah. And Irock had permission to go in there, and he would just try and show off, but he was kind of an idiot. But he was uh, a really minor character in it, though. He was, right? yeah. Okay, oh, that's, they changed him to be this like bounty hunter. Yeah, and I, I just wanted, it could be as simple as... Creating a rivalry between him and H, where like in the opening scene where you meet H, Doe and Show, or Shai, Daito and Show, come on, get it right. You see Irock kind of in the background of like he gets shot, mm-hmm. or some like H takes him out, doesn't kill him, but like like you know cuts his arm off or something like yeah. that, which they can bring back. This is true. Um, so you regrow it. Yeah, well, I mean, like later in the movie, you see him lose his arm again. Yeah, it's like. Oh, I see, like a follow-up bit, like yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. He just keeps losing arms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, classic. Yeah, and so then when he goes to interact with um, what's his face, Parsifal, uh, uh, not Og, um, Halliday. No, the main villain, Nolan Sorrento. Sorrento, thank you. Oh, that's Mendo. When you when you see him with Sorrento, it's not him. I guess you you need a way for him to have the orb, but it's not him. Winning at the end, it's him kind of like picking up the pieces, and like his motive now isn't just to kill Parsifal for money; it's now to get back at H. Oh, okay. So then he just has a a bit of a motive. He he has a character arc instead of just being there for comedic purposes. Yeah, Yeah. but I mean, I I liked his character for the most part. Yeah, he never got annoying for me. They they did use him sparingly enough. Yeah, which I think is the the trick to anything involving T.J. Miller. 
Just yeah. use him sparingly. I was going to say don't use him. <laughs> no. <laughs> I also wonder if they did, because he was one of the first names announced, and uh, I remember when they first showed the billing, he was like third or fourth on the list. Maybe they cut a bunch of stuff. That's what I'm wondering. If, with, yeah. if, especially the after the accusations, if they cut a lot of his stuff. Right. Yeah, Which it's very possible. I mean, all things aside, <laughs> may have been beneficial for the movie. Mm-hmm. You no, know, I think it was. I think he was in there just the right amount. Yeah. Um, and I think he was a good foil going up against, I can never remember his name. I was going to call him Mendo. Like Mendo's character, the whole thing, who was very serious. Oh, Sorrento. Sorrento, thank you. Very serious all the time. What? <laughs> I was like, who is... Oh, Ben Mendelsohn. Ben Mendelsohn. Oh, yeah. Didn't know you guys were on a, like a last name nickname basis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're buds. Yeah. Yeah. They play squash together. Yeah, we play squash. Oh, huge squash head. <laughs> yeah. Nice. He's he's Mendo. I'm Lordo. Yeah. It's, you get a longer name. Yeah, <laughs> I do. They, they lengthen mine. Yeah. Oh, is this like a <laughs> he shortened so you have to lengthen? Yeah, exactly. Thing. There has to be a balance there. It's a big oh. power move. Yeah. Wow, that is true. Um, just a little uh, Very informational Mendo. update. Uh, I think you were confusing Ferris Bueller's Day Off with the fact that we they role play Matthew Broderick's character in War Games as part oh, of the second, the that might second be it. gate. Okay, yeah, I've never actually seen War Games. I've seen parts of it. So, nope. Yeah, uh, I feel like we're not messing out. What's maybe the game so much he has to one. play? He has to play Dungeons of Daggeroth. No, that's the first key. Is that the second key? Uh, do, do, do. oh no, that's the first. Yeah, because that's the one on. Ludus. Yeah. Um, no, I'm saying in war games, he's playing uh, missile missile command. That's oh, right. okay, that's right. Yeah. You know, I I will say again, having forgotten what all these challenges were, I liked the changes they made to the challenges a lot. Mm-hmm. Like in the trailers, the thing that I was most excited for was the car chase. Which I I wasn't expecting it to be the first one. <clears throat> Me either. Yeah. They just jump in. I I think that was smart actually to start off because that's probably the best sequence. I would probably um. I don't yes, know. I, mean, I think the, the shining sequence is great. The though. shining sequence is really fun, but I think that first sequence, just because you're still getting acclimated to the world, so there's nothing on it other than the desire to just show you how this world operates and exists, yeah, is really freeing for them what they created. Yeah, and it, they they jump into it real fast. I like that they did kind of take some shortcuts in terms of keeping the pace going. So when it opens, the first challenge has already been discovered but no one has beaten it yet right i liked that a lot where it's like that that saves us a lot of time and just gets us right into this really fast it was nice that they saved a lot of shoe leather and that kind of stuff where it's like oh i just have to get around because i'm poor in this game Mm -hmm. it's like nope we don't have time for that let's just move on to the next thing and we can fill it with a couple back like back end lines or something yeah i know that was great too like how he had to go to the back of the thing just pick up coins and it's like oh that's like that's so depressing it's like well it's what i gotta do like right and i was trying to remember because Shane, you were talking about this, so Cameron, you maybe can help. Was the DeLorean prominent in the book, or was that something they just did in the movie? I think it's just in the movie. Oh, okay. For some reason, I thought he had... He might get it later. He might okay. have it for the third, for the, the big battle at the end. Okay. All I know is that that made me so happy every time that car was on screen. Did you also they... see what he modded it with? What he... Oh, it had the kit. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the kit. Oh, the night rider. The night rider, the yeah. rider up in the front. Yeah, but like every time that thing was on screen was so awesome. Yeah. Uh, I think in particular during the car chase when there's a tanker in front of him, so he just drops it into hover mode, which like puts it low enough onto the ground. He can like slide that underneath cool. it and pop yeah. it. I'm like, I think that's why I liked this movie was that there were several times where my mouth was just open. I was oh, like, I know. What the fuck is going on? This yeah. is amazing. It was a really nice touch where they just were using certain things and they didn't overuse it. It right. wasn't like, yeah. oh, we're only going to see the DeLorean and it's just the DeLorean. And if you like any other types of pop culture other than Back to the Future, you're not getting what yeah. you want. It. I thought that structurally it was. It had a lot of variety to it. Oh as well. my gosh! Mm-hmm. Yeah, tons. So like, I, uh, so I found a list of all the all the cameos that I missed. Uh, I'm only gonna I'm gonna read off some of the highlights. This is an eight say. hour podcast. All right. Yeah, uh, uh, we can just take a nap over the yeah. corner. Uh, yeah, we'll just, we'll in the him, race we'll scene, apparently in the race <clears> scene, <throat> Luigi is shown in Mar in the Mario Kart cart. Okay, uh, which is amazing. I'm so sad I missed that. You can see the wolf from Okami. The um, what? I'm, I'm not going to ask every time because we'll never ask. finish I'll, I'll chime in when I understand a reference. Yes. I won't go for yeah. that one. Um, so from the SpongeBob movie, you can see the Krabby Patty car nice. in the race scene. That's fantastic. Uh, a lot of a lot from the club scene because I missed that's a it, lot actually, of the Hang on scene. real quick. That's interesting to have that in there because that's a Paramount property. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Now, di- well, didn't he get like a lot of uh, okays from other studios? He got... From everyone. He did pretty much get from everybody, yeah. I mean, so he, there was an article about him, like, getting denied stuff from Star Wars. 
visually, I don't know if I actually saw anything Star Wars in there. They make reference to the Millennium Falcon, but I don't know if I actually... Apparently, you can see a TIE fighter in the last scene. You could hear a TIE fighter. Mm -hmm. I know that, but I don't know if I actually saw it. Okay. Big Foley work talk here. Yeah. Yeah. Great Foley work, man. Not that punch at the end, though. No. Uh, Oh, oh, not. Man. The one that really surprised me, which I'm amazed, because like talking about Disney, uh, apparently Mater is in the race. Really? Yeah, from Cars. Oh, which that is kind of amazing. That is that is surprising. They're they're pretty covetous. Mm-hmm. That's impressive with their, with their IAP. Yeah, I mean, I guess Spielberg has worked with them before because um, BFG was Disney, wasn't it? Yes. Also, at this point, who hasn't Spielberg worked with? Right. Right. I mean, that's probably why he like him helming this film yeah. allowed it to you know get made. Mm-hmm. Well, that's something that Cameron you and I have talked about on previous episodes when we were talking about how excited we were for this movie. Was that thank God it was Spielberg because he was the reason why you got so many IP. For Roger Rabbit. In Roger Rabbit. Like, mm-hmm. so many different things that right. have never been on screen before and never also, again. Also, apparently, Roger Rabbit's in the club scene. Is he? Yeah, Roger and oh Jessica. Oh, my God. No, that's, that's amazing. Awesome. Uh, also, apparently, Wally's in the club scene, <gasps> as well as Mr. Incredible. Wait, is what? Wally... That's awesome. Are Wally and Eve dancing? I don't know. If that if they miss that... I, I only like... just read a list, so I, have to, I don't know visually oh. where they are. It's like your heart just broke, and then your yeah. heart just got mended back together. Yeah, I know. Uh, Wally and Eve in the bar me. scene. One of his gifts. Dr. Fate is in the bar scene. Okay, that makes uh, sense. Gandalf and the Troll, the Troll King from the first Hobbit. Oh, okay. Um, They can be seen in the, the final Goblin fight. King? Goblin King, that's who it is. Wow. wow. I just had to correct someone on Lord of the Rings thing, and I don't know shit about that. That's right, do I. Uh, John Vasilius? Snow and Danny are in the club. What? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's cool. Uh, Piccolo from Dragon Ball Z is in the club. Sick. Uh, Baymax and the Powerpuff Girls uh, are in the final battle. Oh, cool. Um, Baymax. Yeah. I think I was there. And Waluigi. He, he, oh, I love Waluigi. Apparently, he's oh in the bar God. scene. I mean, because the, there was a, a number of thing, little things I picked up on. Lots of DC stuff. Unsurprising that it's a, a Warner Brothers film. So they specifically call out Batman, like, right. you know, like rock climb with Batman. But beyond that, like, I saw Blue Beetle, Harley, a mm-hmm. couple Jokers. Yeah, Catwoman. So, yeah, Catwoman, yeah, Michelle Pfeiffer, Catwoman. there was a Batgirl, too. Yeah. Yeah, there, there was. was a Batgirl in the final fight. Um, yeah, obviously the 60s Batmobile is featured pretty prominently in the mm-hmm. opening uh, car chase. Yeah. Um, which, which of the, um, the final, or the high five had the Mach 5? Uh, it... I don't think any of them. I think that was no, just... No, because it was either... Who are they? They're Daito and... Daito and show. 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 One of them has it because when they show him going to collect the scroll after completing the race, that Mach 5 is in the background. Oh, oh yeah. then it must have been Daito because Show's car blew up. Oh, that's right. What did he drive? Uh, oh, he had the Trans Am. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he, oh I think that was um, Smoking the Bandit Trans Am, right? Mm, I can't I remember. remember. I'm pretty sure. I blacked out in that part. You were just, just, too, just too overwhelmed. Too overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah, I was too overwhelmed by the excitement. Just foaming at the mouth. I was point. like, oh my God, are those, are they, is that a band without people? What? Oh my God. <laughs> but, that, like, that was actually that my a, highlight. Uh, is that a Disney favorite. Phil Hart magic reference? Yeah. Oh <laughs> my God. <laughs> Wait, I missed this entirely. What? <laughs> I don't know. My favorite cameo was French horns. <laughs> <laughs> this movie has everything. <laughs> it's, got, it's got a whole French horn chorus. Um, but like, I did love, like, I loved in the car chase. Like that, it, it just visually that is absolutely stunning. Mm-hmm. Like we've talked about um, Adventures of Tintin and why that movie is amazing, and that with like mocap technology, when you put it in the hands of someone like Spielberg, he'll do something <laughs> interesting with it. And so, like, have you seen Tintin, Shane? So Tintin. it's it's pretty fun in my mind. Mm-hmm. It's like the spiritual successor to the original three Indiana Jones films. Oh, like, cool! I would I would say it's more on par with the original Indiana Jones than the fourth movie was. Wow! By a huge margin. Oh, interesting. Really fun. Okay. Um, but there is this extended chase sequence through. I think it's like Morocco or something that looks a lot like Morocco. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's very Spielbergian that it's like Rube Goldberg s in terms of like a tank crashes through walls and the, like the whole building starts sliding down and like things are weaving in and out all this craziness together and it's all done in one simulated single take. Oh, cool! But that is something you can do in a CGI film because right. you can stitch all these things together and you could never do that in live action. And I thought he did that again here with the car chase. So there's just like some crazy movements going around and stuff, just jumping in and out of the frame. And you can't really do that. I mean, we've basically got to the point now where you could, mm-hmm. but it seems much more seamless and organic when it's done in CGI. So that's how you get, like, the T-Rex jumping in and King Kong's there. And, and the wrecking ball, as he's turning the corner, the wrecking ball's, like, already there. Yeah. I think the thing I love about it is then when he does it and goes under, yeah. you get to see the origins of every piece. Yeah. And yes. it's like, obviously, when people are building out uh, some sort of stunt or some sort of long-form action sequence those things have to be done in their head or in pre-production or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But then to actually kind of get to see behind the scenes like yeah, you would yeah. in, you know, a Mario level when you can kind of walk behind the background. I was going to say, yeah, there's there's the developer world right? Mm-hmm. where exactly. a lot of games, uh, most of them are taken out, but some of them have like the special areas where you can go 
and just avoid everything and see the whole oh, world. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's what this was. And it was just like the developer's area. Yeah. And I loved seeing well, it's, that. Because that's a great gamer's reference, but also it brought variety to that sequence. Like, I was a little bit worried, like, oh, are they going to just have us do this all again? And to do it from a completely different angle like that. Right. Like, that's a, I was really genuinely surprised and impressed by how they didn't just repeat themselves and they did something completely different. It was nice because it didn't feel like it was going to be, like, if they're going to have to do this challenge multiple times, how are we going to make it not lost time yeah. in the yeah. film? Yeah, and yeah. they just like burned through it real fast and gave a completely new angle on it. I really enjoyed that. I, I did love the scene. I hated how they set it up, though. Oh, which is like, oh, we could just... Backwards. You should go could... backwards as fast as possible. Because we that was what was great about backwards. the... What I loved about the book is like you could see how smart he was. And in this one, it was just kind of like, how did no one catch this reference? He's literally saying it into the camera. You should go backwards as fast as you can. Backwards. I, I yeah. think it was the problem with you know it being a shorter yeah. medium than a book or something like that. And as I'm now going from being like, eh, it was okay to trying to defend these pieces mm-hmm. of like the part where they they had to have some sort of Deus Ex Machinas to make it so because there's no time to just ruminate yeah. in a film mm-hmm. where something like they can't have a montage <laughs> after every single one where he's just like he's thinking or he's at a library. There was the time pressures of this film were so much tighter because yeah. instead of him being the discoverer. Of the first, like the first gate, everyone's already found it, right? Or and then for like the second, the second one, they're all already there, or they don't even explain how anyone found the third one. It was just like, yeah. oh yeah, I think they we just said like the IOI just found it. Yeah, yeah. Even with the second one, which I appreciated, is they were wrong the first time, mm-hmm. and they they had a whole scene around them being wrong, and I yeah. think that really connected to the book really well. Yeah. Well, I I liked both those sequences too. I liked the club sequence, like beyond just the the reference fest yeah. that it was, like, visually... It was... <laughs> Shout out Robert Zemeckis. Yeah, right? <laughs> I don't know. I, like, for me, that visually, that was a pretty cool sequence. And I'm, I'm curious what you guys thought about so much of the film having CGI avatars. I didn't find it distracting. I also didn't find that they were less connectable as a result. If anything, I was kind of more connected with them and their <laughs> avatars than I was with the humans. Definitely. I think that they did such a good job with that. Like, the just... The CGI was fantastic, and I think they, you know, they were playing a little bit with house money, knowing that we know it's a video game, and they're yeah. not trying to recreate anything real. Mm-hmm. I think that's part of the trick, right? It's like you go and watch Rogue One, and the CGI Tarkin still throws me off a little bit, right? Because it's like a little uncanny valley. Style. Yeah, and they, they basically just subverted that by like, well, the whole world looks like this, and so we're just mm-hmm. going to lean into it, right? But then doing that and making us all on the same page that we understand that that's what we're going into makes it feel so like. Like, we want to be complicit in that, and we want to live in this world as well. Yeah. And we know that these are the rules of the world, so this is what it's going to look like. Mm-hmm. And I, I almost wanted to, I wanted to see them in that world more. Like, I, I wanted to see a film, like, where it's just the first act, where it's just, like, these people living in this world. Like, yeah. I, I don't want them to have to go through these quests <laughs> or anything. Just, just show me more of what that was, because it was so well done. You yeah. should watch Warcraft. I'm going to have to pass. <laughs> I mean, look, I'm actually curious about Warcraft. I didn't see it when it came out in theaters, but I love Duncan Jones. But to be fair, I haven't seen Mute, which I also heard was not great. I think Warcraft is very underrated. No comment. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, no, I'm being sincere about that, though. I think it... I think visually, We know how sincere you are about bad films, Cameron. I know. I think visually it is what you're saying, though. It is living in that crazy world, because it, you know, it is the world of Warcraft world, and just kind of seeing orcs and, and all of the other races interact with each other. Like it's, you do get immersed in that world and mm. you do get to see kind of the clash of digital with real. And I think they handle that really well. Yeah. I think like for, for me, what I wanted to see was like in that PVP fight at the start, Oh yeah. when they're introducing all the other characters, like Daito, show and age mm-hmm. and everything. I kind of wanted to see <laughs> like, what is this? Where, where are we going with this? And because they talk about trying to acquire more artifacts. And mm-hmm. I think they did a great job of just kind of layering those pieces in that paid mm-hmm. off in the end. But uh, I almost wish the movie was five minutes longer and I saw five minutes of just that that yeah. fun where they can, like they did with the battles and they did with everything else, just drop a few more characters in, have these characters live in this moment and just let us enjoy this instead yeah. of having to grow at every moment. Because it felt like, even though it was, what, two hours and 12 minutes, I did feel like we were constantly pushing mm-hmm. because there was so much information. Yeah, here. well, I think one of the... One thing that didn't quite work for me is that you could tell points where they had clearly just cut out scenes that explained things, right? So the first time I noticed it was when um, 
Wade is back in his van and he's no longer in the super expensive suit. Mm-hmm. And then as he's running back to the stacks, his aunt's boyfriend is wearing it and there's like a line like, Oh, thanks for giving me the suit. You're like, Oh, clearly there was a scene where like they got to a fight again. Right. They got cut out or they, uh, they couldn't afford any more good Foley work of the uncle punching people. No, yeah, <laughs> they couldn't have any more just like hand slaps thrown <laughs> in there. Yeah. Like that, or just the fact that all, all the high five show up in Columbus or even at the end when all of a sudden they're, uh, H is driving around in the van. Like, clearly there was a moment where they got caught and then they had to start escaping, but all of a sudden she's just driving. Like, you can feel those points where they clearly just cut out stuff for the sake of time. Mm-hmm. But I will say that in doing so, I think there were times when they let us live in that world. But I agree with you. I wanted to spend more time living in that world and getting a sense of the character and just what makes it interesting and maybe less of the plot stuff. There's so much plot in this movie, though. Well, even the stuff that you're saying that they cut out is it sounds like it was a lot of real world that they cut yeah. out. And it's like maybe they were just like, oh, man, people want to see this, this I, I, the Oasis. Yeah, they probably did. Too I'm sure, like, world. in test readings, people are like, yeah, we, because that was the same for me, too. Like, I really identified more with the Oasis stuff. It was just more interesting. It was more, it was different. Yeah, you and, uh, you and Parzival have the same hair. You do what? You guys have the same, same hairstyle. Get that flip in. I, yeah. I was trying to find so there's a going kind of jumping back to the like living in the world of, of like the action scene about acquiring artifacts and all that stuff. There's a genre of anime that I was trying to find the name of that I couldn't remember. Oh, oh hi, sorry, uh, I'm back. It's a brief, it's a brief point. Um, it's, it's blowing up in, in the anime world right now. The idea of going to another world, oh, like and sword adapting. art on, online, and exactly. All kind of stuff? Yeah, mm-hmm. um, that was kind of the, the one that. Made it so popular now, mm-hmm. um, but I wasn't that like Dot Hack before that. Mm-hmm. Dot Hack was in the early ninety or, or early two thousands. Um, but there's so many of those. You have No Game No Life, Log Horizon. Uh, there's you know I, there's at least three every season now. Mm-hmm. Um, but with it growing in such popularity in Japan, I wouldn't be surprised if it is going to come to America soon. So we might have those and sorry we might have those movies coming out in the next five years of kind of like we're being teleported to a new world and we have to adapt to the new rules and here's how we're going to have to deal with that. Well, sort of like that... A Wrinkle in Time. Or like Jumanji? N- no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think though, I, like, I mean, Jumanji was so successful mm-hmm. and then if this is like, I know Wrinkle in Time didn't do very well, but mm. Ready Player One, if that's really successful as well, they might, you know, start doing more of those things and we'll see it, like you're saying, in, you know, 14 months or so. Yeah. Well, what, I, Sentai? I, th- I think I again... What worked for Jumanji, which I think in some ways worked for this too, is it, it Jumanji especially knew exactly what it wanted to be mm-hmm. and was very <laughs> consistent all the way through. I think this had a pretty good sense of what it wanted to be and was mostly consistent. But when it and, wasn't, like the end scene, for example, right. it was glaring because yes. it really didn't fit in with the rest of the tone of the film. Or those weird like little kid moments like Sorrento getting kicked in the nuts. Ugh. Why, like, why is that? Right, why it, is it in there? It definitely, you know? yeah. They did. I think that's almost a testament to how good the rest of the tone felt, though. Yeah, because it felt so consistent that when those moments happened, you could everyone like you. There was like a noticeable shrug in the audience. Yeah, where everyone was like, "Oh, what? Yeah, what is this why? doing here?" And you know, I think that's one of the things that I thought was interesting about just this being Spielberg was you got a sense of him always pushing himself to do something. <laughs> new like visually right and you can see that he's talented again talking about like the structure of it all and the visuals it's incredible and i think the performances for the most part are actually like pretty solid I'll agree yeah yeah olivia cook i think especially is I great her, in this. Yeah. I, she's amazing i think they're all great i mean i don't think anyone really stood out as just being uncomfortable to watch yeah no i think everyone's really good but you get those senses like sometimes he does stuff that he feels a little bit out of touch with it's like that ending shot of like the two of them like kissing in the chair it's like oh yeah go live in the real world and by live we mean just get a super hot girlfriend right yeah, you know, yeah. as or, long as you have money, this is great. Yeah, as long as you're like rich and in charge of the world's biggest company and have a, a hot girlfriend and you're you're white and straight, you'll be you'll be great. Yeah. You'll have a grand old time there. So, so I was talking to my friend Britt about it, and she I think she made a really good point. So she's not a book reader, mm-hmm. and so when she came at this perspective, she was coming at it from more of a Spiel, as a Spielberg fan sure. than as a, like a Ready Player One fan. Mm-hmm. And one thing she mentioned was the fact that Spielberg. Uh, when he grew up, he didn't have like a traditional family. His parents got divorced, yeah. and so he, in his films, tries to make things that have your family be created like an un, a non traditional family, yeah, an unintended family. And so I think when we see these pieces, we see it's like, oh yeah, 
because in Ready Player One, it's this dude who's lonely, and then it all works out for him. But what she saw was she saw like the creation of a non-traditional family, and then that, oh, that the purpose of that last shot mm-hmm. was instead to show that instead of being like, yeah, if you're a straight white male, it's all gonna work out. It's like anybody you can find your family even in this Anywhere. like in, even in this dystopian world. See, that is an interesting perspective. So along those lines, do you think that that last scene would have had more impact if it was all five of them yeah, in oh, like the office together? Definitely. And you, you still yes. could have had like uh, Artemis and Parzival, you know, whatever, Samantha and Wade like cuddling up together as everything else is going on. But I think that would have emphasized that point more. I agree. Yeah. Um, but I did think it was an interesting take because I think somewhat as being readers of the book, we use the context of this book, which was – like somewhat, I don't, I don't want to say, I want to say close-minded mm-hmm. or like, or like singular, it's a very singular perspective. Yeah. Uh, and when we, then you kind of take a step back and you haven't read the novel. Well, let's call it a book. I wouldn't call it a novel. Uh, <laughs> let's call it a masterpiece. Let's, let's, not, let's not be overly generous. <laughs> masterpiece. Yeah. Uh, then I would say it was more something that actually does speak towards family and being more open-minded than when we see the book as like such a singular perspective. No, that's actually a really good point. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm slightly more forgiving of the end. Slightly. I'm slightly. Not. Slightly. Yeah. I, I just, I think some of those t- tonal gaps were, were just really weird. Also, why, why would you have sensors in a cod piece on your suit? I think that they're, I mean, I mean they, they touch on it just for like a second, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah. At the start when they go to that casino. Oh, world and yeah. Like, like, you can go over there. Yeah. That motel. Yeah. There's like, oh, there's kind of a gross side to this world. And I actually thought they did just like even having that just one half second reference, like yeah. a single line does, I mean, does kind of justify so much of that other world that otherwise people would be like, eh, what are you talking about? Why is that not yeah, there? Why is that there? Yeah. <laughs> but can you imagine what rule 34 would be like in oh, this environment? Oh, there's a whole world. There's a whole galaxy. Yeah. Of fetishes. Oh, God. Yeah. But, oh, oh, no. Uh, you know, I don't want to see that movie, though. So I'm glad I didn't. There you go. I kind of do want to see that movie, actually. <laughs> I'm trying to think of what the porn title would be for this movie. Dead Air. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll That's back. actually we'll what the that. title would be called. It's Dead Air. Because <laughs> everyone's just staring, just going, what? <laughs> we'll, we'll loop back to that. What? We'll, we'll loop back. Let's not. What is this? <laughs> yeah. Gaspar Noé's yeah. Oasis. Fantastic Foley work. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, so, you, so you keep bringing up the Foley work, and I just want to <laughs> throw in my input on this. Okay. Because it is it is very odd sounding through a lot of the movie, and I think it is because um, a lot of the sound effects they use they pull from eighties films. Right. So, do you think? Do you know if they actually, in fact, like sourced it from the original source material? Uh, I don't, mm-hmm. but this is by guess. Okay. And since I'm saying it on a podcast, it's 100% accurate yeah. and fact-checked. Truth. Oh, yes. fantastic. Yeah, because that's how this works. Yep. Um, and I think, because uh, you're talking a lot about the the punch at the beginning. Um, yeah, the, like there's like three distinct punches that I remember. Like the when he gets punched by his, un- his aunt's boyfriend. Mm-hmm. When Rick. <laughs> Is that his name? It's Rick. Yeah. Oh, of, course, of course, it's a Rick. That's a strong name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then at the end when, what's her name? Facsimile. Oh, effect. oh, finale, finale, finale yeah, <laughs> dude. It's, it's, it's a solid Madi- uh, Maddie on reference. Um, when she punches uh, Mendo's character, in oh, the, and then the back of the mm-hmm. squad car, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then it ends and the back of the, the paddy wagon, yeah. Well, then it ends after the punch is the Back to the Future sound effect. Oh, is like, it? Yeah. Oh, wow. Well. It's the like uh, like the bump bump. Oh, oh, yeah. I guess that was in there. Mm-hmm. And then uh, <clears throat> when uh, whatever her name is, Facile. Jumps into, Finale. yeah, that's fine. <laughs> and whenever she, Familia, when yeah. she jumps into the back of the, the truck and she hits uh, Ty Sheridan's character and he like goes spinning and yeah. there's kind of almost like the, the punch and then I want to say there's like a, yeah, like yeah. a little whoop. Were you waiting for a slide whistle? Yeah, I really was. I was, yeah, I was waiting for James Bond to jump an Alfa Romeo over a river. Uh, actually, it was. Oh no, a, it's a Ford. No, it's it? um, it's an AMC Pacer. Oh, you're totally right. I think. Yeah, yeah. I know it's an AMC because they go to like the AMC dealer <laughs> in Thailand. Yeah, no, that's where most AMCs are. I would, yeah, I would assume. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank God Sheriff JW Pepper also happened to be hanging out there. <laughs> I mean, what do you do when you're on vacation? Is you go check out you cars? Go, yeah, you go <laughs> test drive cars. I don't know if you guys have done that. Yeah. yeah. For those who are, are lost, they're going over James Bond cars right now. Yeah. 
We're back. We're back. Also, we're back. Wait, we're back. Just, what, what I love is that this is encapsulating our friendship in a nutshell, which is at some point, Shane and I will get on James Bond tangent. At some point, the two of you will get on an anime tangent. Anime over video game. <laughs> yeah. And then Chris none of us will actually talk at the same time. And then Chris and Cameron sync about everything. Yeah. Um, so Batman. yeah, we should show a Batman chat. It's yeah. Like, wait, wait, Batman's in here. Batman's in there. Yeah. Do you think we could have used some more Batman? Maybe. Obviously. No. <laughs> <laughs> Although, hang on. I do want to mention uh, that I, clearly um, Sorrento's character was modeled off for of Superman. I mean, mm-hmm. he had the whole spit curl thing going. Yeah, on. definitely. Which and that makes sense too. Like you could see that guy just picking like, oh, this is just this symbol of power that I'm going to take and mm-hmm. model myself after, but completely miss all of what makes that character significant. Did well, his skin change throughout the thing? Because uh, initially, wasn't he just wearing only a suit, and then slowly it became like a suit with battle <laughs> armor on it? I think t- I think at the end, he had some armor on on top of the mm-hmm. suit. That's kind of cool. I liked how that they, yeah. like, they would... Because that's such a thing nowadays, especially like changing the skin of your character. Because mm-hmm. yeah. they only allude to that so... Like the really, very beginning when he changes his hair, he changes yeah. His hair. Yeah. Yeah. and then when he's changing clothes, and like I thought that that scene was fun, but it didn't really pay off a ton. Like I know that it, it did pay off with the Lena Waithe piece and everything mm-hmm. like that, but I thought that in the book doesn't it talk more that like H kind of has a crush on Parsifal? Uh, not too a little bit, but not too much. Oh, okay, um, then maybe I'm just wrong. Well, because they don't reveal that it's a girl until the very end. I think it's m- more like actually farther back because it's before they go into the entire third gate thing he meets everybody but artemis yeah oh that's right yeah yeah he meets them all like at the last minute right i, mm. I think uh, yeah because um ogden gets them all yeah together. recruits them all together to mm-hmm. like try and win mm-hmm. did you guys like that we kind of met the real life people faster this time rather than saving all to the end like it was kind of spread out a little bit more how'd you guys feel about the, the it just the general restructuring of what wade's relationship was to them in real life uh, I mean, well, when we heard the interview with all of them at WonderCon, they That's brought true. up the reason why, and it's because they have all these actors and they want to put their face in as yeah. soon as possible. Yeah, I mean, Lena Waithe is great. Yeah, so so it makes sense. And the other guys are good too. I just yeah, they get a lot less. Too. I like that the young kid was fun. Like, I mean, yeah, they so. gave him just enough, and he did a really great job with it. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I was fine. I didn't like um, Artemis's motive because she didn't have one really. I mean, well, I like to because like she didn't really want to win. She just didn't want Sorrento to win. Yeah, I mean, because they changed. Well, because there's like a resistance here. I mean, this is where you see like the hunger gamifying of this movie happening. Right. They had like this idea of like the kids rising up against the establishment. Yeah, that and sort like of thing. everybody has to be part of something bigger than them, kind of thing. Yeah, which mm-hmm. I thought more or less worked because mm-hmm. I was trying to remember in the book, Artemis is just trying to win to win. Right, no, or... she's trying to win to help the world, but I okay. think I, I think the justification they had in the movie where she's it, it felt like one or two steps too long where she was like, my dad, he got into debt, but also he went over to the IOI place and then he was there and he got really tired and then he died because he was like really hungry all the time. Mm-hmm. Felt like just, I mean, obviously it's a real justification of like, yeah. these people killed my father, but it needed so many steps because this world is so complex. Yeah, that's it true. It felt yeah, like it lost a little bit of that je ne sais quoi. Yeah, mm-hmm. that momentum. Yes, I exactly. think it would have been better if it was just, because it, if they did it to where he was just taken by IOI and he was put in one of these camps and which is never seen or heard of again. Right. I think that would well, have made... Yeah, she ends up in one. Yeah, so that was, that's what I was going to say. That oh, would make that oh, so sorry. much more powerful when she when she got there of like, I just lost everything. Like, there's no way I can. I I wanted that heartbreaking moment because every emotional moment was very undercut in this movie. I think that's fair. Yeah, I mean, um, when his aunt dies, you're like, this is the only person that I'm connected to. We don't even have a beat to really feel for that moment because no. he's already just thrown into the next thing where he gets drugged by the guy with the eye tattoo. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Fantastic. will be played by Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yes. <laughs> Um, oh, but I wanted to, to loop back to the, the Superman thing for a half second. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's very fascinating that Sorrento would pick Superman to be the Avatar when just before we see that, um, you have Parseval and Artemis talking about, um, what's his face? A- uh, Anna, not Anna Rath. Um. Halliday? Halliday. <laughs> for some reason, my mind went to, his, went to his Avatar first. They said his favorite quote is the Lex Luthor quote. Yes. Hmm. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting parallel of like Holiday might think that he's a villain for creating all these things and doing these bad things to bad people. Mm-hmm. Where Sorrento sees himself as a hero yeah. trying oh, to. Yeah. That's, that's actually interesting. Like he yeah. thinks he's doing the right thing. That's great. What did you guys think in general of 
uh, Mark Rylance and his portrayal as Halliday. I thought it was fun. I thought like I thought they did a really good job of showing that like he wasn't this person that was he would may have been revered, but he wasn't even revered. Like he didn't even really appreciate the things he did himself. Yeah, because he thinks he he reg- regrets doing what he did. Yeah, and I thought that was an interesting juxtaposition against everybody who is like treating him like this god and this prophet in this mm-hmm. world, and in the end, obviously they they're shutting down the oasis every once in a while because this thing they've created is taking over reality. Yeah, but I almost feel like the the pieces that they they built with him of this thing is so bad, this thing is so bad. And then here's the opportunity to shut it all down, and then they didn't take it. Yeah, really negates a lot of what they built earlier in the film, of these missed opportunities and the fact that the oasis is bad for everyone, because they didn't have to show that he can just turn it off whenever and then chooses not to. They could have just taken that piece out, but the fact that he made the active choice not to listen to everything that Halliday has regretted and feels bad about for creating mm, this oasis. I mean. Yeah. I think then invalidates a lot of what they built, which was fantastic yeah. with the acting of Rylance and Yeah, it does and, undercut that a lot. I hadn't even thought about that. Because I what I think is interesting is that Halliday seems to be aware of the the consequences, but he's kind of ignoring it. And like his big regret was one his big regret at the end was revealed at the end to be um kicking Ogden Morrow out of the company. Right. But also Ogden his was rosebud. acting as his, his rosebud. Uh Ogden was as, as acting as his conscious. Like, Ogden was the one who was saying, like, you, this is getting out of control, and Halliday's kept ignoring him and ignoring him. Right. And ignoring him. And, I, yeah, I thought they did an interesting job of, I just thought the portrayal of Halliday was great, because he's kind of uncomfortable <laughs> to watch when he's on screen, because he's so weird and awkward. And mm-hmm. I, he's kind of this interesting figure of, like, imagine Steve Jobs, but without the charisma, but with a soul. Yeah. It and was... I thought that was really cool. And I even like that his his avatar is <laughs> very... Like gregarious and like energetic and charming and sweet and much more like like a Dumbledore esque sort of figure that even the disparity between those two yeah, was really interesting. That was a fantastic juxtaposition. And then having his character just be so uncomfortable did then justify why he kept making these decisions. Because yeah. you're like, oh man, he just does not get it. Because he's just like, so so out of touch with other people and with reality. Mm-hmm. And he also had that dope denim on denim look. He did, you know, man. Which I was like, oh man. Rocking that Rock, double denim? That's Rocking f- the Simon pin with the Space Invader shirt underneath. Oh, dude, that's a fire yeah. fit. Yeah. You're going to be seeing yeah. me rocking that in LA Oh, that's soon. my Comic-Con uh, cosplay this year. Oh. <laughs> double denim holiday? Yep. Are you going to get like a long perm? Oh, yeah. Dude. I'm just. I'm not gonna cut my hair until just grow it out. Yeah, yeah. I, I could do it. I could see you doing it. Yeah, dude, you're so LA. You could pull it off. Oh yeah, yeah. get a, get a nice man bun going for a bit. Mm. Oh, and you've lost me now, <laughs> and it's gone. And it's gone. It's gonna be great. <laughs> you guys, just wait. Yeah, no, I I liked him a lot. Um, I liked the way they used Simon Pegg because we, we talked about this too. That it seemed like he went to waste until the reveal that he was the curator all the way through. Mm-hmm. Which a uh, little pat in the back myself here. I picked up. I picked up that it was the voice. I didn't necessarily think that it was. Also, his character. Awkward, I just, yeah. I just assumed that was them just doing a little clever, fun thing of like, oh well, we have Simon Pegg. Let's go ahead and just have him do, uh, yeah, right. A, a, a British actor playing an American actor, pretend to have a British voice, which he he <laughs> honestly nailed that. That was yeah. great. That was yeah, so fun. <laughs> I, I I liked how they because that wasn't in the the book at all, but like having that the, yeah the museum the cur- the curator. The curator and everything. I thought that was super fun to see. Mm-hmm. Like I almost wanted to see more of that, where it's just like, oh, you can replay full scenes from this dude's life. Also. It makes you wonder, like, what kind of guy, like this guy that's so out of touch, creates a museum of his life with every single scene of his life? Well, I don't I mean Halliday didn't create that himself. Why not? Yeah, he, he said he, it opened the day the contest started. I guess we, it, it's never confirmed that he's the one that opened. Oh, I it. guess because I thought they said that they reconstructed it from, like, this memories and descriptions and like uh, nanny cam footage and stuff like that. I was, I guess, I read it that. Um, oh, maybe maybe the scenes were created from that, and maybe the library when it opened was just like I, I just assume that whole library wasn't Halliday necessarily. That that whole library was created by someone that generated as was created as a result of a need because this contest existed. Oh, see, I thought I, I guess I took it as that he had created it because when it opened with the contest, and Og, Ogden noted that he was like, I don't know anything about this contest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I figured that the only other person that kind of could have created it was Halliday. Oh, okay. I, I assume that 
how it had nothing to do with it or little to do with it, and then maybe it was even Ogden had some involvement, possibly, mm -hmm. or it's just it's it sprouted up as a need. Yeah, because I guess it's a good question. Is they never really address this, and I don't remember how it was in the book, but can other people create things in that world, or is it a finite world that's bound by what Halliday created back in the day? I mean, it sounds like you can mod stuff. Yeah, well, it sounds like you can mod stuff to a point, though, because, like, IOI, they were talking about what will happen when they get control of it. They're going to, like, <laughs> occupy 80% of the screen well, for advertisements. That's, I think that's different than modding, because mm -hmm. modding is in-game stuff. Yeah, right. And but that's, that's hardware, not software. But I think the thing was uh, every, still wrong. <laughs> the game always would reset at midnight. It was like everything would happen because that was like a big crux point for the first challenge in the book. Oh, was right. Everything yeah. would reset at midnight. Yeah, okay. Because then you could do the challenge twice if you did it like at 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. I think it was he, Halliday had built all of these things and they could be modified to a certain degree within <laughs> you know your 24-hour time window. Mm -hmm. But then at, at that end, everything comes back to, to what oh, okay. it was yeah, I, I imagine then you couldn't go and create like a whole new planet within it would be my you guess. You wanted to like, say a whole new world so badly. I didn't actually. A fantastic I, I, point of view. Yeah. Do, you, do you honestly think I would stop myself <laughs> from making a Disney reference? That's true. You had yeah. a hair flip. There's I have no self-control. No one here to tell us now yeah. or where to go <laughs> or to say we're only dreaming. <laughs> it's a whole new world. <laughs> but when I'm way up here, it's crystal clear. <laughs> what have I done? So let me share this whole new world please with you, don't. Shane. No, please don't. I'm done. <laughs> Unbelievable sky. Camera okay, walked out. Okay, we're moving on. Um, thank you for taking us on that magic carpet ride, Cameron. You know, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> You're all fired. <laughs> you should just take over, Shane. I think, you think you've got this from here? I'm yeah. like, I've watched Batman Beyond. Yeah. yeah, you got it. Yeah, we're good. I watched yeah. a little static shock. Oh, super oh we're, static. I mean, we, so we were originally planning on holding you out as a guest until the yeah. NBA crossover episode of Static Shock, which you're going to come back for, obviously. I mean, it's I'll amazing. definitely, I, I mean, I'm such an ace in the hole in the podcast game. Yeah. So, <laughs> Did you like, ever watch the NBA episodes? I, yeah. I mean, I, when I was like 12. Okay. But I got to, I got to come back to it. You got, you got Shaq. You got Steve Dash. Oh, this you is got amazing. Allen Iverson. This is his first team all NBA. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I think Yao Ming made a made an appearance. No. They they were all what a humanitarian. Charles yeah. Barkley was he in there? I don't think so. I'm just trying to throw out athletes that I know off the top of my uh, head. Just list three athletes. Um, oh, I can actually do that. Devin said I can do a whole bunch of the sharks. San Jose Sharks. Devin said Gucci, uh, Patrick Marlowe, Joe Thornton. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Evgeny Nabokov. I'm not sure who he's playing for now these uh, days. Now name five Pokemon. Oh, Nabokov. <laughs> you mean the, the classical music? Director? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Con director, conductor. Um, five Pokemon. Yeah. Uh, Psyduck. Yep. Mew. Yep. Blast toys. Sure. Um, uh, Pikachu. Yep. Eric Bul Bulbasaur. <laughs> <Yeah>. Eric Clapton. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Gen Seven. They got really real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you steal jo <laughs> George Harrison's wife. Yeah. His powers. He just starts playing Layla, and everyone drops their doing. Just holds up lighters. Yeah. Sways. Really. <laughs> Badge. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, where were we? Um, I have no fucking clue. All right. Uh, so I'm trying to think of other other things I wanted uh, wanted to talk about here. Oh, okay. So um, we, we were all saying the the, the shining sequence. Oh, that was great. I, I, I think something that could have been really shitty if you're just really creating scenes from a movie. Um, like I look at like this is one of my problems with like Seth MacFarlane, for example. Right, is you go and watch Ted, and he just recreates the dance scene from airplane which in of itself is spoofing saturday night fever right and you're like well this is what's the point of this like you're just recreating something that already exists mm -hmm. i thought that they completely sidestepped that here i mean they did recreate the dance scene from saturday night fever in this they film. did which i again that was one of those moments my jaw was down because i i love disco guys i can't dance for shit so whenever someone else can they can do a beautiful disco dance i'm I, You're all in. I'm, I'm all in. Yeah. Uh, I'll be a little honest about that scene. I was very disappointed because there was a rumor going around the second challenge was DDR based, and that was that scene. Ooh. And I was waiting. I had I, I had such high expectations for that moment. Just want <laughs> just wanting a DDR scene in a movie again. You just want to see your life up on screen I camera. Did. Yeah. You just wanted to see some people spending way too much time playing DDR. Yes, I did. Hey, that's your thought. Maybe <laughs> it, maybe he didn't spend too much time. You can do. Can you do twelve steps? <laughs> of what? Like, yeah. <laughs> like <Sorry>. addiction? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 combo? Nope, I can't. <laughs> yeah, Cam actually went through AA so he could get better at Dance Dance Revolution. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. this really puts your mind this in, the is... head, in, the, in good headspace. Yeah. Vodka. This yeah. whole glass is just filled with vodka. Hey, that's fine. Do what feels right. Yeah, it's 
Gotta it's almost late. noon. Yeah, it's hey, fine. It's five o'clock somewhere. Yeah, I just skipped the tomato juice. I was like, you know what? Fuck it. We're just gonna go straight to the good stuff. Yeah. Um. Mm. Uh, but yeah. The, no, okay. The Shining. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, I, I so. <laughs> Because in the movie, they give eight shit for not having seen The Shining. You two idiots haven't seen The yeah, Shining. The Shining. Uh, sorry. Uh, not a huge horror film guy. Thing. So, I mean, look, I'm not either. Mm-hmm. I watched that when I was a kid, and it freaked me the fuck out. Yeah. Um, I watched it just a few months ago, actually. Um, like, I could, like, watch it in a screening room. So it was, like a, like, a great way to sit down and rewatch it again. That movie is amazing. And I think it's one of those that... Uh, surpasses its own genre, right? Like, I'm not a horror guy either, but, like, it's a classic of cinema. Like, in the, in the same way, like, if you... so many tropes kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, like, or just because it's such a huge impact on how film is done. In the same way, like, if you're not a sci-fi person, at some point you should probably sit down and watch 2001 A Space Odyssey. Right. Mm-hmm. Which, mm. no. <laughs> really? I will be honest, I didn't love that when I watched it. I feel like I need to go watch it again. Well, it's playing in 7mm at the Cinerama. Well, thank God. Yeah. You should get down there we and go see it. We should go down, yeah. Um, but so what? Wait for Kubrick did, to make a special appearance. Yeah, dude. Did, <laughs> <laughs> no, Hollow Ed, Kubrick. Uh, no, Edgar Wright only shows up at my movies. Yeah, so that's that's just, he's sure. like, I yeah. just wanted to introduce this movie for Stanley Kubrick. Yeah. Also, Edgar Wright's uh, like a light Australian man. Now. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a spot on Edgar Wright impression. Oh, thank you. So yeah. I was gonna say I listened to uh, to jump off topic for a seventeenth time. We right? don't do that. Mm, uh, right? would we never. keep it nice and tight here. I finally listened to <laughs> uh, the... everyone. Uh, look down at your <laughs> look, look, look down at your agendas. <laughs> Um, I got finally, what's missing. I finally got to listen to the director's commentary on Ragnarok. Oh my god, I've been waiting oh, so long for that. Should we just do that one night? Just <laughs> sit down and watch it because it's just Taika just talking for two hours. Okay, and it's amazing. That's beautiful. It, it's like just him just talking about nonsense. I'm like, oh yeah, this scene right here is actually me in a mocap suit playing Chris uh, playing Chris Hemsworth. Yep. You can't tell, <laughs> uh, but you can actually see that the, the biceps are digitally enhanced to make me feel better because I was having a bad day. <laughs> Feeling weak today. This is, uh, this is me playing Chris. Yeah. yeah and it's, it's just Chris so... Chris Shit, that went John Lennon for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. It's, it's just so <laughs> delightful. Well, Yoko, why couldn't I get you in the movie? <laughs> uh, also, Yoko Ono's in Isle of Dogs. Is she? Yeah. She is, actually. Oh, yeah. Well, well, yeah. Playing how... Yoko's own, playing Yoko Ono's translator. Oh, how salient. Um, did uh, I someone just pointed out to me recently, did you do you catch that Isle of Dogs is a pun? For I love dogs? Yep. Oh, I never heard <clears> that. I didn't notice that until it was pointed out to me. Crush yesterday, <laughs> actually. Did you know that I I rock is actually uh, a play on I Rock. Oh, oh shit. I thought it was a reference to K Rock, the famous LA radio station. <laughs> I thought it was a reference to the early United States Iraq conflict. Yes, it was. In fact. Uh, I was going for like Indonesian rock music. <laughs> that too. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's like yacht rock, but for Indonesians. Yeah. Well, you have J Rock, which is Japanese rock. Yeah. So I rock is, it just makes sense. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Very layered. I'm reference. so glad we got to see, a l- we all saw this movie with different perspectives. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of that, though, me like having seen The Shining, I understood all those references. Like, how did that all play out for you, having not seen it? Like, did you know enough about it to recognize like the significance of Room Two Thirty Seven, or had you seen references to the shower scene or to the the hedge maze, the blood coming out of the elevator? Like, did those things like resonate because you had seen them pop up somewhere before, or how did that work? Yeah, it's kind of like you know when you get to a certain point when everything that's so famous becomes becomes a trope instead of becoming the original thing. Like, yeah. Because so many people have paid homage to it mm-hmm. that you understand. Homage. Homage. Yes. Uh, that you see all of those pieces in what you're doing. So even if I haven't seen The Shining, I understand like the axe through the door yeah. or Room 237 or the like the hedge maze where he's limping but he's catching up and everything. Yeah. All the- like all of those things that were so iconic that they're they've been replayed a hundred times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or like yeah, the all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. So like you know, like sitting there at the typewriter and just the pages drifting. The pages drifting, or like the 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 twins are like kind of yeah. demonic or anything Stay like that. With us, Danny. Yeah, right. I mean, I guess maybe that's why they chose that specifically. Because I mean, obviously they pulled from whatever Warner had access to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like you could just imagine Steven Spielberg at a like a, at like a, a library, like one of those giant Dewey Decimal cabinets, yeah, and he's just, just like. No, no, no. He's like Dick Tracy. No. <laughs> yeah, I because that that scene was really really fun for me. That I was like I was a little worried they were just gonna have to like recreate stuff, but they they really turned it on its head. And the fact they had a character who'd never seen the movie dumped into it, and they got to react naturally to what was going on around them. Mm-hmm. And the fact that it was H two just gave it that much more personality. Yeah, that was that was really fun because like, a lot of times when you have somebody experience something for the first time. It has to become a teaching moment, and yeah. it's really monotonous. 
but this felt so fun because their un, uh, their expectation that people have either heard of, seen, or understand The Shining, and then that watching that character discover it for the first time is just a really like a fun romp, yeah. even if I haven't seen it. Well, it's also fun too because that character throughout the whole story is very confident, total badass, and just very in control and on top of their game. And then it's like, oh, this is the thing that just completely throws them off. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It uh, was it was it was a really fun. That, sequence. I think that second part, I, I was like, didn't feel fully realized, like the zombie dancing thing. Yeah, that was a little bit on the weirder side. Just because it, it didn't feel like it was rooted in a reference, whereas this the, this last scene we've seen is so strongly rooted in a cultural touchtone. Yeah. And then <laughs> they're like, actually, this is a complete misdirect. It's this instead. But it, that they don't then root that in some other cultural t- touchtone. They mm-hmm. use a, a, a made-up piece of IP where yeah. it's like, this is Holiday's first game, dancing zombies. Yeah. And you're like, wait. I play that game. Yeah, but like, wh- where does this stand when when we're we're enjoying so much this piece of The Shining? Like, oh, these are things we know. This movie is built on references we understand. Mm-hmm. Here is an important plot point, a reference that no one could ever connect to because it's a thing that's fictitious in this world. Yeah, That felt a little... Out of place, but maybe they were just trying to make sure everything didn't get bogged down in a reference. I feel like if they hadn't gone to something kind of original in that moment, like where where would you have gone with it? Because like, so for example, in in The Shining, in that in that ballroom, there's not really like I think I think at one point there's a whole bunch of ghosts dancing. I don't remember exactly how. It went. Yes, I think there. Are. Yeah, but like it would have been. I guess I liked that they did something kind of different at that point. Like, mm-hmm. it was like, okay, we're going to get back into our world. I like that it was Artemis, not Parsifal, that it was doing the challenge. Yes. Yeah. Gave yes. another Agreed. character something to do. Mm-hmm. And maybe this is just me wanting everything to be a little bit queer, but I kind of, like, because the whole thing was like, oh, he never actually kissed her. I kind of wanted Artemis to kiss uh, Kira. Mm-hmm. And that to be the how she yeah, got the key. I don't know, because for me, like, yeah. I, that's where I was expecting it to go, but from my perspective, it didn't feel like it would have been gratuitous or sexualized. It was mm-hmm. just, it, like, maybe part of that just comes down to, like, Olivia Cook playing that scene well, but you can almost tell where she's, like, a little bit awkward, <laughs> even just, like, with the dance part of it. Mm-hmm. And I like that. I felt like it could have gone there, and it wouldn't have been, like... Well, there's even the scene right before they find the ballroom where they're like, oh, the leap he didn't take, the kiss. Yeah. And there is that awkward pause where Artemis and Parsifal look at each other and they're like, like, oh God, don't do it. Is this what we're supposed to do now? Right. Yeah. And then they hear the music like, oh, okay, we should go that way. Yeah, yeah, but then it did feel like that didn't pay off. It was like, oh, they should have kissed there or like that's the thing that figured made them figure it out. But then that she didn't have to do it later felt like, I understand, I agree that it's like maybe it wouldn't have felt in the tone of this PG-13 movie or yeah. it wouldn't have tested well, but it does feel Good like that, that yeah. should have been the payoff that yeah. she should have tried to kiss her or something. And it even like not have to happen because we don't want it to be sexualized. We don't want it to be that. Yeah. We just want it to be that's the payoff of they realized it earlier because it was supposed to, they were going to kiss, so why wouldn't you kiss later? Yeah. yeah. But it, it still it gave it some the whole thing gave it some variety. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was it was nice having that middle challenge be incredibly different because by the time we get to the final challenge it's big and crazy and bombastic like it was in the beginning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I must say, I liked the final challenge, but it almost felt like there was too much going on. It was a lot. I mean, it's it's just reference city. Right. And I, I, I that's why I guess I wish it was a little bit longer, because mm-hmm. those shots were so busy, which is yeah. fine. Like, And it's great, because it, it's going to really play well, you know, being able to, like, with its rewatchability. Mm-hmm. But it just felt like when you're watching it for that first time, I was having trouble focusing or just understanding what's oh, yeah. happening because mm-hmm. there's too much happening at once. No, I think that's fair because you, you look at some of the the great, huge third acts in film. I think like the end of Return of the Jedi is one of the best, right? Where you're cutting between these three distinct locations, but in doing so, everything is contained with each of those spaces. So even though we're intercutting, we know how things are progressing linearly with each one, right. whereas everything is happening here all at the same time. Mm-hmm. And there is no sense of understanding of time, even though they continually, they reference time where they're like, you have, like the the way time is treated, where they, at one point they have 90 seconds Yeah. when the when the Gundam cre- is created, which <sighs> it was awesome. Oh. I mean, that was so sick. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, I, 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 like, have, I know that thing. I have no association with Gundam whatsoever and that scene, Again, jaw on the floor. Oh, yeah. When I was talking to other friends that had seen the movie, and I was I was voicing my complaints like I'm doing here, then there was like a pause in our messages, and I'm like, but all of that got subverted because we got to see 
uh, Mecha Godzilla fight Gundam. But what that was so cool? Oh what gosh. I liked so much about that though is we stopped cutting to everything else. Yeah, and we, we did just spend some time there. Yeah, yeah. In that moment, we lived with these two characters, and you, you like, yeah, it's a it's a trope where it's like the big bad has to fight the like the the number one good guy and all that kind of stuff. But it felt so nice because like this movie was a bunch of tropes put together. So why don't we see that trope where it's just like. Number one fights number one, and we get to see it all pay off there. And I know it wasn't, I mean, Daito isn't number yeah. one, but just to see two big robots fight and focus on that, whereas the rest of it was so chaotic mm-hmm. trying to fit in, yeah. we really enjoyed that part where we just focus on one part of the battle. But I think that's also what Spielberg loves to lean into, is like having all these things going on simultaneously, <laughs> so they, they interweave. And I, I would agree that I think this time, at the end, the interweaving didn't work quite as well as, say, like the opening car chase right yeah but that being said when they're driving around in the DeLorean with both the doors open and they're just like pulling every like gun imaginable from video games possible mm-hmm. yeah that was fun. I like was so on board from Halo 2 yeah uh, exactly very beginning the Gears of War yeah they had the Gears of War saw blade, the, the Halo rocket launcher, Halo rocket launcher. Uh, H was using the assault rifle from Halo in the first battle mm-hmm. um, the rail gun uh, someone yes. was using I think she was using the needler at one point that's, that's yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, the the needler. Yeah. Very I was like I was I was loving yeah, all of that. But I liked that because also it was we were tracking one character yeah. throughout that battle, and we were just seeing the other characters contribute to that. So we were seeing their little piece, but we were still tracking with just one thing, the DeLorean. Yeah, and that like that felt nice. Whereas like the Iron <laughs> Giants pieces were happening in the background while I'm watching also the Battle Toads fight IOI guys, and I was like, yeah, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm I'm and my like I'm a little overwhelmed at what's going on. No, I think I think that absolutely. Do you is think? Fair. Um, just going into the logistics of, of all these properties, because I know the rules in from uh, Who From Roger Rabbit were like each one had to have a specific amount of screen time. Oh, really? Do you think that was just like, you can use our character, but it has to be front and center for like 10 seconds? That'd be really interesting to see what the, like, if there, was a blank, if there was a blank, if there was a boilerplate agreement that they did, or they had to do individual agreements with everything that they mm-hmm. pulled, because like yeah. you said, there's just so many references. Yeah. They must have had you know, a whole legal department that was just working on only securing that copyright piece. Oh, I can't, can't They imagine. should have their own credits at the end of the credits. They really should. I know, right? Well, Seriously. yeah, so, I mean, I imagine that all the all the DC, especially the Batman stuff, that would have just been probably an internal request from Warner Brothers being like, okay, this is, and probably, again, with it, like, with The Shining, too, it's like, that's a Warner's property, so it's right. like, well, you have to pull from our stuff, that's fair, here's what we're gonna pick. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that was a bit of like, okay, because we're distributing, <laughs> like, here's how much you have to put in there. I know with Halo, Spielberg has a connection with that franchise because he's working on... He did on... the animated movie. Did he? I think he produced it. I thought he was producing a TV, a live-action TV series. Oh, or maybe. Because li- at one point, it was going to be Peter Jackson producing a live-action movie, but I think now it's Spielberg producing a live-action TV show movie. But he has a con- a- an association with that property. So oh. I, b- I imagine on that one, too, because like, Halo was pretty prominent yeah, that... throughout it. Like There was a, a whole <laughs> squad of Spartans. A lot of the weapons were in there. Yeah, mm-hmm. That was um, cool. That was fun. Yeah, I liked all that stuff. So I imagine that was probably there. Well, and I think the I think the biggest reference pull was from Street Fighter of all things. Street Fighter and, and Overwatch, I think, had the oh, most yeah. character appearances. Oh, Mortal Kombat. Oh, yeah, we had a good that oh, Mortal the, Kombat the, the Goro a, scene. Goro okay, scene. that was great. Yeah, the Goro scene, the chest buster, and then yeah, the, cutting yeah. through it. Yeah, like that, it justified its existence as a reference. I thought, which was hard, uh, not always easy to do. I agree because I, I was like, oh, what do we? What do we? Do? Oh, okay, that's fine. I yeah, was like, yeah. what are we doing? Here? We're just that. doubling yeah, down on so references cute. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, these are just like hats on hats. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely a hats on hats moment for a second. But it paid off. It though. did pay yeah. off, which was nice because it did. It took me out and then put me back in. Yeah, yeah. I was mm-hmm. like, okay, they gave me a reason for this. Okay, it's fine. But I did actually do to have a side question. Mm-hmm. How is she just unable to go under a staircase? Like, why is she able to kind of break the, like... Break the code? Yeah, break the framework of that world. Like, that was... And obviously, it's just a plot device and everything like that. But it did feel so different from everything else of, like, well, why is she just able to go into these... Yeah, and only did it once. And only did it once. We didn't see it again. There's no justification, etc. But, like, I don't think it took me out of the world because I was too busy worrying about why Chessbuster's busting out of a Mortal Kombat (laughs) character. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's this movie in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I have this problem, but there's six references on top of it. Yeah, well, it was like I mean, I think that was just it felt so quickly paced. Sometimes yeah. I was like, oh wait, what? What's going on? Oh, that too late. Yeah, like, <laughs> where they like he blew up the stacks, and when he blows up the stacks in the book, 
he's like, oh my god, I have to move. Like he ruminates. <laughs> I have to move. Yeah. It sense, like, Honestly, it's the oh worst thing. Mind, bro. Yeah. It's the worst thing you could possibly do is move. Yeah. But he's like, my aunt's dead. I have to move. To move. Which is, oh. I have to like file an address change with the yeah. post office. Which is, uh, and then I have like, uh, uh, God. And then you know maybe my mail will go to my old place. I have to call them. Like, hey, can you forward this? It's really important. Yeah. And it just ends up only being credit card applications. Where she's yeah. like, I didn't even need these. I should have just kept my address like that. The old one. Which, speaking of which, someone is keeping their address as my address in Los Angeles, driving me up the walls. Oh, God. Yeah, so can you just do me a favor? Just I'm sure they listen. The address. I'm sure they listen. 100%. They know who they are. Yeah. Um, Nick Vickmorson. <laughs> that's it. That's yeah, exactly it. shit. Hey, don't you spit, spit at the Nick Morrison name. Um, but yeah, just uh, there, there wasn't, it didn't feel like there were many times to really rest. Like, the only time it felt like there was a moment of emotional like baggage was when they were leaving that dancing scene yeah. and they have this conflict. Yeah. But other than that, I never really get to live in that moment where we feel any emotional significance because at every moment we have to get on to the next thing or we yeah. have to s- check in with another character because there was so many people that needed servicing because we needed to service all the real world characters and all of the Oasis characters. Yeah. So it's almost like the cast is twice as large. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, though, did you find the book emotionally resonant when you read it? No, but I think that was more because the writer was not a great, like, a, a not good at communicating those emotional perspectives mm-hmm. because these problems that this character was facing were so small in the scope of everything else that was yeah. happening. But I think that the way that this tonally changed, where we're really trying to feel for at least what's going on or feel for these characters... Even in this, in the movie or the book, we don't really see this poverty that they all talk about, or like yeah, this dystopian true. world, as mo- and we see it a lot more in the book. Yeah, and we barely see it after you know, like that first thing where he's climbing down the stacks. Mm-hmm. We really never see again a, the plight of anyone in this world. Right. Mostly, we just see people walking around, just hanging out with their oasis gear on. Yeah. yeah. That, that's what I meant from what I said at the beginning, where I wanted to see how far back he was. Well, like, oh, right. When mm-hmm. he already started with the DeLorean, I was kind of surprised. Because, like, I feel like that'd be a pretty rare card to have. Yeah, it'd be pretty, pretty Or at sweet. least, like, yeah, it'd be, it'd be, it'd, it would be awesome. But I wanted just, like, just to see it juxtaposed next to, like, a, like a cleaner DeLorean. Or, yeah. like, it was the same model, but it just, like, his had, little, like, the upgrades. And you could see yeah, that his was, like, the bare minimum. Broken down. Right. Yeah. His was the Back to Future 3 version that didn't have the flying circuits, but it had the uh, the big chip on the hood of it. Yeah. And the white wall tires, my fair version. That's sure. I, that's what I wanted to see right it's there. It's the train. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Wait. Oh, Jesus Christ. I feel like I'm going to regret asking this question. Have you not seen Back to the Future 1, 2, and 3? No, I have. Okay, thank God. Yeah, but like, only, uh, I'll be honest. I think I've only seen Back to the Future 2 and 3 maybe once. Oh, three's my favorite. Really? 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 Hey. <laughs> Wait. Well, hang on. I didn't say three was the best. No, no. I, I said I, it was my favorite. Yeah, but like, still, I'm going to judge you for an opinion. It's a fun Western. It's a romp. I, it's I, a great romp. Yeah, but you know what's a great romp? One. Yeah, one. Well, like, no, like one is like a, a nearly perfect film. I absolutely agree on this. God, like, it's, it's one, so one, good. One is a masterpiece, and it is a significantly better film than three. I'm okay for giving the flaws of three because it's really fun, and as a kid, I just loved that goddamn movie because it was like... Cowboys, and there's a DeLorean, and it's like there's a thing on the train track. But, like, the train sequence just feels, if, from my memory, the train sequence just feels like they took the first movie sequence of, like, we're building against time, and we've got to go to these things, and they're just like, oh, let's just play this game at, you know, like in a, in a Herald or something. They're like, what's the third beat of this game? Sure. But it, I don't know. It, it works for me. I thought it, it, it was a new way of tackling a problem they had already faced before. And it, visually, it's really impressive. It's just edited really well. It's very fast-paced and fun. And I loved it so much as a kid. Like, every Christmas, we had a little train running around the Christmas tree, and I would build stuff out of Legos to, like, sit on the track and get pushed around. Because, like, for me, that's just the coolest thing ever. Uh, just, just to cover our listeners that, that aren't used to our terms, Harold is a style of improv, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, and game means, like... <sighs> Like third, because this took me a long time to understand uh, what game I'm meant. Sorry. Oh, I yeah. still, I still don't know these terms. Yeah, um, I mean, we may all have met in an improv well, class. We might be recording this in the back of an improv studio, but well, I am not a or improv person. Welcome back to another episode of Talking Prov. <laughs> yeah, God. Uh, what, prop talk. Called? Yes, and <laughs> prop talk. Prop talk. Yeah. Prop talk. Yeah. Crop top talk. Crop top. Prop talk. Yeah. Nice. The people who make props for movies while wearing crop tops. Yeah. Exactly. Oh I, man. 
I'd watch. Get a big audience right there. Yeah, yeah. it's just like making props for '80s films. Yeah, yeah, the whole podcast That's about that. Say, <laughs> fit right into Ready Player One. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about how we didn't see enough crop tops in <laughs> Ready Player One. So, I mean, the whole world needs more crop tops. Well, so that, in that actually is a uh, part of the world that I wanted them to jump into a little more. Not just the crop top idea, but like in the book, 80s, 80s life took over everything. Mm, with like I, the school and the chat rooms and everything. Yeah, like that. and I would have loved to see, like, we get, obviously, we get all the references, but I would just like the aesthetic of the 80s to have played a, a bit of a bigger part. I. Where, like, you get, like, uh, the color scheme, like the super saturated color scheme, the kind of off uh, non or asymmetrical designs, uh, kind of the architecture is a little bit on the crazier side because you can also get around all of that with with this being digital. Right. I, you know, I would say that I think there are elements of that at least. Like I, if you look at specifically um, the high end fashion of like Sorrento and Focaccia. They were both. <laughs> they finale? were, bo- yeah, finale. Yes, okay. they were you're, both. You're a little too far for me. <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> Shane got it. Feel a tennis. <laughs> they, you know, like he's wearing like a very boxy, double-breasted suit. Right. Yeah. She has a you know a turtleneck and big shoulder pads going and, uh, on. Dope, dope bangs. Yeah, and like those crazy bangs. Like, I mean, I agree with you. I think there could have been more in the oasis maybe like that could be saturated further into that world but i thought that there was enough of that in the real world to at least throw a bit of that in there okay so cameron let me ask you a question Mm -hmm. would you if you if you know budgets were the same and they this is a perfect world would you rather have seen this show be like a 10 episode mini mini series yeah 100 percent. and just have like an episode about h or an episode about oh skin style oh no i was thinking (laughs) Nope, wasn't referencing that, but uh, sure. <laughs> yes, yes. Sorry. Uh, and and uh, uh. and no. <laughs> I was thinking like yeah, but I mean like just like that that structure where you see uh, like each episode maybe a little bit about like we're not Parzival is not the protagonist in every episode. Maybe mm-hmm. maybe we see a side episode where it's just like Daytone show just living in this world. Mm-hmm. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, I think the longer we could have lived in this world the better, because I think we could have fleshed out everything out so much more. Well, okay, here's a question. Would you rather have seen this be like a two-parter, like a Deathly Hallows? Or do you feel like that might have been... I feel like I'm the wrong person to ask, because I would just want more of this. So I'll always say yes to more. Okay. Um, but but yeah, absolutely. I would love for like the first movie to just be the first two keys, or even just the first key, and then you see the, the, the pressure of like, oh, IOI is right on our ass. And mm-hmm. it ends with like them showing their power of blowing up the stacks. Right. And then it has to, and then part two is all about kind of the rebellion. And yeah, um, I thought that would be a fantastic, I mean like first act break for a, a two part series of some sort. Yeah. I disagree. Really? Of course I, you do. I think it, sh- this was Fuck what, you. <laughs> fair enough. I think this is what it should have been. I, for me, the book and the movie are both frivolous. They are really fun, mm-hmm. really, really fun. I think if you draw all of this out, it loses some of its fun. I think part of the reason this worked is that it was very pacey, maybe a little bit too too much so. Mm-hmm. But I think if you try and draw this out, and I agree with you, the world is really interesting. Like I think it it is one of the most interesting world, like pop culture worlds, have been created in a while. Mm-hmm. I mean, I wouldn't say it's up there with like Star Wars and like Harry Potter. But in the same also apparently Harry Potter's in the final fight scene. Oh, is he? Apparently. Well, that makes sense. It's Warner Brothers. Yeah. But like in that same, just trying to expelliarmus everyone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, expelliarmus. Can, can we not? <laughs> just a bad cadaver for them. God damn it! <laughs> They're not rear. Now we're in PG thirteen. Just do, use yeah. the killing spell. The Come killing on. Spell. It's actually like year three Harry. They yeah. couldn't get like they weren't high enough level to yeah. get year seven Harry. <laughs> He's just he's just spraying like Patronus <laughs> mist at people. Why isn't this working? We got him, Levy show. Yeah. Dobby shows up, starts throwing shit at people. That'd be great. There we go. But I think like it is an interesting world, one that you it is a world interesting enough to want to play in outside of the primary story in the same way that like Harry Potter and Star Wars is. But I think if you draw this thing out, I think it it loses its strength, which is just being a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think it I don't think it would have worked if you if you did it longer than this. So what do you think you so if they're writing he's writing a sequel and the the spine of the the main one is this quest solved. He is like he is the pinnacle character. He uh, the how like what what do you see in the second book I, if he can't he can't fall, right? I, I think you I mean the honest you don't. I think the problem is is if you go down that 
path, you start veering into like matrix sequel territory where it's like, you have this really powerful, important single figure in this digital world. There's weird amb- like yeah, ambiguous he rules. He owns the Oasis, but does he really own the Oasis? Yeah. Like I think I don't, I don't, you don't follow this up. I think that's the thing. Like even reading the book, I, when I heard the news, we might be getting a sequel. I was actually disappointed. I didn't want to spend more time. I liked the ambiguous ending. I think, <laughs> I think that there there are small stories be told in this, mm-hmm. but there are no more big stories be told in this. And the problem is, is this world is so massive and so expensive, frankly, you can only tell big stories. Big stories in this. Now, I would love to see like, I don't know, like a comic series or maybe like an animated show that like played around in this this space mm-hmm. and had that sort of like freedom and fun and got to go very small scale. Yeah. Um, but you I, you don't do a sequel book, you don't do a sequel movie, you just let it be as it is. It is it is flawed. It is absolutely flawed, but it's fun for me. And doing anything more would just so undermine inter- that. That's interesting you bring up an animated sequel because um, there's no actual animated sequel. Oh, okay. Sequel. I was, uh, was going to say, I was like, what? Are you breaking news for, <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> for Warner Brothers yeah. right now? Um, no. <laughs> breaking stories from Cameron. Um, there was one... Uh, there was one reference that I was kind of surprised they left out. What the out. fuck is going on around us right now? I don't know. Oh, actually, I know what's going on around us. They're tearing down Meltdown as we record this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, rest in peace, Meltdown. Uh, yes. there, was, there, was one, there was one reference that I'm kind of surprised they left out. Uh, because it Jaws? Does... Was it Jaws? Yes. No, it was, yeah. was I really right? <laughs> well, See, I was so hyped for a second. I was like, oh my God, what? Um, no. No. <laughs> no, um, no. Yeah, because no, the, no. The, the movie did a very similar thing to this. And if there was no Lego things in this, because the Lego movie and Lego Batman oh. is this idea, um, but at the same time, in November we're getting another movie which is very similar. Wreck It Ralph breaks the internet. Yeah, is going to be I think is going to be another version of this, but the Disney version of it though. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm very excited for that. Yeah. I mean, I guess it, it kind of makes sense they wouldn't have the Lego stuff in there. Um, because I just want to see like a tiny, tiny army. <laughs> That, okay, you know what? That would have been actually would have been really great. Like, see a whole bunch like a tight, like a little tiny army running into the battle, like building stuff to go fight. Actually, that would have been really yeah, fun. Just have been, a small, even like like a there. like a mist of like you see it kind of like yeah, it's like this overtake like, this, a character this weird and then it's swarm. Like, like what is that? It goes into like little Lego people like <laughs> yeah, pulling like, them apart little, yeah. or like little pickaxes. Oh my god, they're, they're carrying around the little uh, orange like separator brick and they're just like attacking <laughs> the person trying to break them apart. <laughs> That'd be fun. Pixel by pixel. Attack! Yeah. yeah. Okay, I would have loved that, actually. I agree. Yeah. So do you think that uh, Racket Ralph just did this exact same kind of trope better? Like, it, Oh, it, in the first one? Yeah. Um, No. If I'm going to compare this to anything that did it better, I'm going to say Scott Pilgrim. Okay. Uh, because mm-hmm. I think yeah, they used fair. the references more subtly. Uh, it, 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 wasn't, it clearly wasn't the same level of reference, but I think they... Handle the characters better in Scott Pilgrim. Mm-hmm. You did make a good point of like you did double the cast by having both in game and out of game characters. But in Scott Pilgrim, you had Scott and Ramona as the main characters. You had the band, which is two more characters, Young Neil, right. the seven evil exes, mm-hmm. um, and then uh, Stacy and the girlfriend played by Aubrey Plaza, whose name is Jane. <laughs> Jane. There I don't go. know. Go, Jane. I don't know. Um, Was it Jane? No, it's not Jane. Um, was it Jaws? Yeah, it's Jaws. <laughs> is it Quint? Uh, it was Jaws 3. We, uh, we know who she is. We know she makes her living. Problem solved. Frank Stallone? Yeah. Uh, but you had <laughs> you like this, this, massive, um, this massive cast you had to give at least a little bit of character to. And I think every character in Scott Pilgrim had that moment, of, had a small character moment, uh, where in this one I felt like a lot of that did fall flat. Mm-hmm. Um, while still holding up all the... the comic book and, and nerdy references. Hmm. Well, I hate to be... The also f- Speed Racer. <clears throat> of course. More Speed Racer. I hate to be uh, the bit of the buzzkill, but we are basically out of time here. I know there's another podcast coming in right behind us. Mm-hmm. Uh, any other last final thoughts? Any messages you want people to take away about the experience of watching Ready Player One? I think coming through this, talking about it, I think I, I did enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll I'll probably rewatch it. I think I will mm-hmm. too, Yeah. But I don't know if it's going to be like a go-to for to any degree. Like I don't no. think it's something where I think I'd rather if I saw it on TV and a scene comes up, I'm like oh, I want to watch this first race scene. Yeah. But I don't think I'd ever. I, I'm not going to be like, oh man, I got to put this on and stop what I'm doing. Yeah, right. I think that's fair. Um, 
yeah, it makes me want to rewatch Scott Pilgrim and The Last Action Hero. When? Oh, mm. wait, have you guys seen The Last Action Hero? Oh, yeah. Uh, probably not for a long time. Yeah, yeah. it's been a couple of years. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever seen it in its entirety? Or like this movie, have you just seen it when it pops up on television and watched like the latter three quarters of it? No, I was going to say like WB at 2 p.m. on a Saturday in yeah. like 1999. Oh, yeah. It's like yeah. The Rock. Like no one remembers the opening scene of The Rock is them stealing the VX gas because no one has seen that scene because everyone has started watching it <laughs> when like Sean Connery is blasting through San Francisco in the Humvee. Right. And finished it <laughs> yeah i don't uh, i think this is a, like a movie that even if i saw a scene like that i wouldn't be like oh i got it i'm locked in for the rest of it yeah, like right. i can kind of come and go and be like yeah nah, i know what happened yeah it's so mm-hmm. like like for me if i see like casino royale on tv on a bond marathon i'll be like why am i watching this part way through i'm gonna stop what i'm doing and sit down and rewatch this yeah that's not gonna be ready player one for me or like if i come in like when like in the in between scenes like in the poker scenes when they like he has the heart attack or anything and james bond i'm like well, i'm kind of dialed in for the rest of this thing yeah so good uh, do so, you have any messages for for our fans? Chris? No, I, look, I think I was kind of defending this movie yesterday. I had some friends who really didn't like it. I think if you just go in and want to have a fun ride, that's what delivers on. If you try and get too much more out of it than that, if you really want to enjoy it, uh, leave before thirty the seconds. Life. Before, yeah, I, I think it, when you see the crowd with a preponderance of old people wearing haptic suits, yeah, yeah uh, just just walk out. Yeah, I think a lot I of think, bald spots there. Yeah, just accept it for its flaws and like let yourself just have fun with it. Which yeah. hopefully you've seen it if after you've listened to us talk about it now <laughs> for the last hour and forty five minutes. Yeah. Um, but so Shane, what we do at the end of our podcast usually is we have our bat plugs. Okay. Uh, where we talk about stuff we've you been stand up and spread them. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, nope. Don't worry, I brought lube. It's fine. Um. We talk good Bonnie <laughs> Dude, Sorry. every week. Yuck. Yeah. Um, yuck. <laughs> wow. I'm, wow. I'm personally offended. I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying, not for me. Do you have something to plug? <laughs> Do you have something you've been watching or listening or reading to recently that you want to give a little shout out to, a little little quick chat about? Um, let's see. I uh, just finished uh, season one and two of Insecure. How was it? Oh. Really good. Really, really good. Uh, first season of Insecure is fantastic. Just feels like nothing I've really seen before mm-hmm. visually. I, it's just great storytelling. The characters are really well written. They're flawed. Mm-hmm. So you, when you're watching it, you're not really, I don't want to say you're rooting against or for anyone, but it's just really enjoyable to watch. And it's okay. got some great comedic elements, especially like the first season is really, really strong. So okay. I'd recommend that. Sweet. Yeah. I think it's, that's a, it's HBO, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, trying to think what else. Mm, I read that book, uh, Evicted. Really, really good. It's about the Milwaukee housing, uh, low income housing market. I would definitely recommend it. It was on uh, Obama's like books he read in 2017. Oh, okay. oh interesting. It's really, really fantastic. It's a, a pretty short read. It's like 200, 200 pages or so. Mm-hmm. And they follow uh, both black and white families through like the last five or six years. Okay. And just seeing how everyone's treated, how things are funded, what happens when you are as part of like this culture where you're constantly being evicted and trying to find somewhere to live and how it affects your career, your family, everything about you and how race plays a part in that and how people are treated. Oh, wow. It's really, really, really fantastic. All right. I cool. definitely recommend it. All right. I will, uh, I'll go check that out. Yeah, definitely. I'm uh, almost done reading A Wrinkle in Time, which I have found thoroughly disappointing. So, uh, Oh, I, I I just finished A Wrinkle in Time. Terrible. Yeah, it's awful. It's, uh, it feels like, uh, it feels manic, to be honest. Yeah, it's, 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 it lacks cohesion. It just, it, it, all the dialogue is very clunky and blunt and like all the themes are just like, they're slapping you in the face with it with great Foley work. Does it feel like, uh, the author had to just write the young child character as an intelligent in adult because yeah. she didn't know how to write children. Didn't know how to write for children? Yes. Yeah, no. I've, I've been thoroughly disappointed by it. I understand I'm why. I'm still going to finish the fucking thing. So. Uh, the ending is so unceremonious. Oh, great. You won't even... I thought there was another chapter. I, I'm about 30 or 40 pages from the end of it. I'm kind of like, is there, is there more? Is there going to be more than this? You, you think that there's another yeah. book. Yeah. No, well, there are three more, yeah, apparently, yeah. which I'm, mm-hmm. I'm absolutely not going to read. So uh, I don't recommend reading that. Um, I guess the only thing recently that I started, I've, I'm about halfway through Death Becomes Her, which is a film from the early 80s, I want to say, and it's directed by Robert Zemeckis, Ooh, starring nice. Meryl Streep, Bruce Willis, and Goldie Hawn. Wow. I'm down. 100% um, down. And it's fucking fantastic. Okay. I, I, I have not finished it out, but I have to say that uh, what I, like the first half that I've watched so far, it's a, an amazing exercise in tone because it, it's kind of like Clue in the sense that it's, it's very macabre uh-huh. but also very camp oh. and funny. So it's an incredible exercise in tone in character and also in structure. Cool. Um, like Bruce Willis plays a very like emasculated guy 
and it's it's him kind of playing against type and it, like and also Meryl Streep is hilarious in it. Like we always think of her as this very serious actress. Like she's really really funny in this. Oh, awesome. Um, so I'm gonna be finishing that up soon, and it's I, I absolutely love it. So um, even with not having finished it, I like, go go check out that. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I watched Game Over Man. It's not worth watching. Okay. Yeah, there you go. If you like stoner humor, go for it. Okay, I don't. Yeah. Nope, not for me. All right. Uh, so, cool. where can we find each right. other? Where uh, can yes. we find you, Shane? Uh, at my office. Cool. Right on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you guys have any accounting questions, feel free to hit me up. Yeah, they will. I'm not really on social media, uh, so I apologize. Oh, well, there you go. That's fine. Uh, if you want to reach out to us, if we want to are... send your mail to, to his apartment. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, yeah, give us your address. <laughs> yeah, if you want to move uh, and then not change your address. Nick Just McMorrison. Go yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm watching you, Nick McMorrison. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we are at Tim Talk Pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Gmail. I am Lordifer uh, at Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I'm at Cam Dexter underscore Adventures. If you want to see my face, if you want to see my uh, archived art page, uh, you can go to at Cameron Dexter. And oh, and if you wanna if you wanna buy my shit, uh, you can go to. <laughs> Uh, Core Memories Co. And by shit, you mean your Disney themed t shirts. They're really cool. Which are amazing. They're awesome. Yes. So go check those out. Thank you so much. I'm going to sell those for you. You're just you should. They're too, very too very polite cool. to do it yourself. Yeah, so. and Cam does all the work, the the artwork. It's really really impressive. It's gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but uh, thank you for listening to this rant about this. Shane, thank you for coming and joining Guys, us. Thank it was, you it was a long time coming. I'm really excited to be on here. This was like one of my life goals. Get yeah, off, be well, a guest on a pod. Well, good. You can die now and be happy. Uh, well, you know that's about it. Yeah, we'll be happy. I peaked. Yeah, <laughs> you peaked. Welcome to the other side. Yeah. Oh boy, <laughs> it's a long right. way down. Mm-hmm. Right, thanks everyone. Thanks else. everyone. Right, bye. bye. Hi, I'm Trevor Reese. And I'm Chris Finbrez. And we host the podcast of Two Worlds All About the Flash. You want TV Flash? Got, Got it. it. Comic Book Flash? Got, Got it. it. Fan Erotica Flash? Got it under my mattress. I got it under my mattress, too. We got everything you need for the speedster of Central City, The Flash. And we got new episodes every Wednesday and Saturday. Make sure to subscribe on iTunes and any of the places you can find podcasts. We are proudly a part of the Nerdist School Network. Speedweed. The Nerdist School Network. For class and show information, visit nerdistschool.com.